Hey guys, I've compiled the first half of September stories for those of you who enjoy the longer videos. I'd also like to thank my patrons, Courtney Maxwell, Alex, Helena Renee, Monica Levelace, Gemma Alam, James Gargano, Jill Hutchins, Kathleen Fenton, and Sarah P. If you're interested in checking out the perks of my Patreon, the link's in the description. Enjoy, guys. When I was in high school, I was good friends with a girl called Emma. Emma was kind of quiet and shy, but it was always there if you needed her. When I finished high school, I lost touch with Emma, and that's what happens to a lot of friendships after school. Two years later in college, I started dating a guy called Ben, and Ben's best friend, Gary, was Emma's boyfriend. After discovering we all knew each other, we started to hang out again. One of the nights, we all planned to hang out in Gary's house, have a few drinks, and play a few games. Ben and I arrived at about 8pm to Gary's house, and Gary said Emma should be over soon. That was fine, we opened our beers and started drinking. It was nearly 9pm, and Emma still wasn't there, so we decided to ring her. Emma answered and apologized for being late. She said she just finished getting ready and should be there soon. At 9.30, there was still no sign of Emma, so we called again. This time, her younger brother picked up the phone. Her brother was 15 years old at the time and had told us Emma was not feeling well and was in the bathroom. Gary was worried and asked if he could head over and check up on her, but her brother was adamant that he was looking after Emma and that she was alright and for us to enjoy our night. We didn't go home. Instead, we kept drinking and hanging out because all we thought was Emma just had the simple flu. Just after 10pm, we decided to call Emma one last time. Again, her brother answered and calmly told us Emma had gone to bed and that she would call us in the morning. We left it at that, believing she was safe at home in bed and we didn't want to annoy her brother by non-stop calling. That night, Emma's mom returned home at 12am to find Emma, dead, on the kitchen floor. Emma had been bludgeoned to death by her younger brother a couple of hours earlier. We later found out when Emma was leaving to come to us, she and her brother got into a fight about something ridiculous, and he beat her with a baseball bat and then stabbed her over 51 times. Since her brother was a minor, he was not going to be sent to prison. Instead, her brother pleaded insanity and was sent to an institution. A lot of this information was not leaked, seeing as the accused was a minor. I do know that his parents stuck by him, and he was released after four years. So, to give some background, I went to college in upstate New York, and this happened during my third year. I'll explain what happened, and then the creepy connection I have to this event. So basically, one weekend, I'm eating breakfast with my roommate, and I come across a news article being circulated by some students about a murder, somehow connected to our school. The news article said that a mother was killed in her city apartment. She was stabbed multiple times and had her throat slashed by her son. After killing her, the son stuffed her into a bag. All of this occurred during a fight about her deceased husband's will. After killing his mother, he calls his girlfriend so she can help him move the body somewhere else. They eventually ended up dumping the body in a garbage can somewhere in New Jersey. So, now onto the creepy connection. I knew the son in a friendly way, as he served and worked at the cafeteria on campus. So I would always see him and strike up friendly conversations whenever I saw him. He always seemed really nice and friendly. I know it's not that close of a connection, but still goes to show you that you can never really tell people's true colors. 
The other super creepy part about this story is that his girlfriend was at my apartment two nights before the murder happened because her and my apartment mate were in the same major, so a bunch of people were over to play cards and hang. I remember I sat next to her while we played cards. I talked to her as she seemed super nice. Crazy to think that in the next 48 hours, her whole life would change and she would help move her boyfriend's mother's body that he stabbed and slashed. I was a first year college student, 18 and female. I was working full time and taking 18 units of college classes. My parents paid all my school expenses and did not want me to work. They hoped I'd just concentrate on my studies, but I worked anyway. So, I'd go to school all day, go directly to a fast food restaurant, Taco Bell, then go over to my boyfriend's for a couple of hours, then home. I was young and energetic and able to keep up with my schedule. So one night, about 10pm, the rest of the restaurant employees were already gone and I closed. I worked alone the last couple of hours. A tall guy came to the window and asked what the cheapest menu item was. He ordered it and I took his money. I closed the little window, made change and handed it to him, along with his food item, then closed the little window. It's at this time I noticed on one of his hands, his left, all the fingernails were at least an inch past his fingertips and filed into sharp pointy claws. I thought to myself, my, that's odd, but whatever. He then asks if I could make change for a $5 bill so we could have exact change for the bus. I open the window, take his $5 bill, and turn to the cash register on my left, about 18 inches away, and I started to make change. I hear something. And I look back to this guy's head coming in through the window, followed by his arms and shoulders. He is grabbing me and clawing at me. I think he was trying to reach around me to get at the cash in the register. But when he grabbed me, I thought he was coming in to perhaps assault me. Now, in hindsight, I could have done a bunch of effective things to drive him back. Instead, I was screaming and started pummeling him with my fists. I fought him off, grabbed the paper bills out of his hands, and drove him back through the window and shut it. I missed hitting him a couple times and hit the edge of the counter with my palm. I got big bruises from that, but he ran off. I called the police and then called the owner of the restaurant. The police came and I made a report. The owner didn't want any press and was upset I'd called the police. What a jerk. So a couple of days later, I'm in an inorganic chemistry lecture, which is in a small amphitheater of maybe 150 students. The lecture is about to start, and the guy sitting next to me, on my right, drops his calculator on the floor, right in front of me. I kindly say, oh, I'll get it for you. I pick it up off the floor, and hand it back to him, right into his open left hand, with the long, claw fingernails. Cue my racing heartbeat. I pretend that I don't know it's the guy who robbed and assaulted me. Coincidence, not likely. So as soon as class ends, I raced past five or six people to my left, practically flew right over them, and once I get to the main aisle, I look back. He raised his arms with a clawing motion toward me and growled at me and was in pursuit of me. I took off out of there. The next time I went to that class, he tried to sit as close to me again to intimidate me. And it was working. I decided to call the police from home that afternoon and explain the situation. The guy seemed to be following me around campus and it scared me. I didn't know if he'd followed me from school to my workplace just so he could attack me there. They were miles apart. The police have undercover police watch me at school before chemistry so I can point out my stalker. I had to tell my professor the situation of why I had people watching over me. The plan was to sit in the grass outside my chemistry class, and when I saw the guy, give a nod, 
and walk away into my class. He didn't show up the first stakeout day, but he did the second day. They arrested him. Now, the restaurant owner dropped the robbery charges as he didn't lose anything and didn't want the press. Nobody asked me, and I was the one attacked. The police told me they warned him to never look at me or talk to me ever again. And if I saw him, they will arrest him and keep him in jail. I never saw him again. He dropped the class. My professor even gave me a B, even though I never got better than a D on the tests. He had a lengthy rationalization of why I deserved it, but I know he felt sorry for me. Fortunately, that helped because I was awful at chemistry, stalker or not. I gave two weeks notice to the restaurant and every remaining night I worked, my parents would take a seat at an outdoor table and play cards until I left for home safely. In the fall of 2010, I decided to go back to college. I was a single mom of three boys, but they were all in school now, and me going back was finally possible. The school I went to is a regional campus to a very large university and located in a neighborhood that is known for crime, meth, heroin, prostitution, etc. But it was only a 20 minute drive from my home and I didn't feel unsafe about going there. The first day and first class were intimidating. I didn't know anyone and I was a lot older than most students. At the time I was 28. I sat down in the back of a room at a table and a few minutes later, a lady, who was around my age, sat down next to me. She was very skinny, smelled like cigarettes, greasy hair, sunken in eyes, but she started to talk to me and seemed normal enough. She started off the conversation, telling me that she chose to sit next to me because I was wearing the prettiest blouse in the room. Strange, but as an awkward person, I leave a lot of leeway for people to say or do awkward things before I think too deep into things. She didn't have a backpack, any books, a pen, notebook, nothing. She said her financial aid hadn't come through yet, but she didn't want to fall behind on classes and asked if she could share my notebook. I agreed and gave her a pen and paper also. After the first class, she asked if I would mind going to the library with her so she can scan some pages to take home. I agreed and we started to head to the library. She stops and looks at her phone and says her son just messaged her and needs her to come home to do something. She asks if I'll come with her. I tell her I have another class shortly and that I can't go with her. I ask if she still wants me to go to the library first. She says no, that she has to get to her son, but really can't go alone. I kept telling her I couldn't go with her, and she starts crying. At this point, we were in a common area outside, and the parking lot was to one side, and the library to the other. I tell her I need to go to the library, and she's welcome to come, and talk, whatever she needs, but I have to go. I didn't like being outside away from people with this woman anymore and I was trying to get back to a busier area. She gets really upset, starts screaming, basically says, screw you to me. I can't remember how the interaction went exactly because I was just frozen in confusion by how quickly she transitioned from friendly then to crying and scared and to now screaming in my face a slew of hateful, angry things. I turn around and start walking to the library and called my friend up so that I would have someone aware if this lady tried something more than just screaming. I get to the library vestibule and watch her through the glass doors. She's standing at the parking lot and a car pulls up with a man in it and is obviously very upset with the woman. They're arguing but I can't make out what they're saying from inside the vestibule. Eventually she gets in the car and leaves with him. The next day, I was dreading class because I didn't know what this woman's attitude would be that day. But she wasn't there the next day. In the end, she never came back to class. I didn't know her name or at the time how to look at a class roster. But looking back, 
I am fairly certain she was not enrolled at the school at all, and for whatever reason was trying to get me to leave with her. I wish I knew her intentions, but at the same time, I am glad I never had to find out. This happened to me three years ago. I was in college, but I took night class because I was working full time by day. That night, my class ended around 10pm. The school is a bit farther away from my home, and I could walk, but it was winter and lots of snow had fallen that week. The walkways were full of snow. It would have taken me forever to walk home. My bus app told me I had just missed the bus and the next one was 30 minutes away. When this would happen, I would always walk to the nearest subway because there was another bus stop, and instead of waiting and freezing, I would walk to warm myself up a little. So, this is exactly what I did that night. The shortest way to the subway station was through a park. I always took that path, and I had no reason to worry that this night was going to be any different. Before arriving to the park entrance, I noticed there was this guy with a very recognizable hockey-themed winter hat, smoking near benches. As soon as he saw me, he picked up his things and slowly walked toward the walkway. I have no idea why, but I found him suspicious, and I remembered something my mom told me when I was a kid. When you feel like something is off about someone at night, find any reason you can to slow down and let him walk past you. You'd rather have someone walk in front of you than behind. For some reason, I thought he was weird and did just like my mom told me. I faked receiving a text and slowed down so he would be in front of me. He was so incredibly slow, as if he wanted me to get past him, but I would just slow down even more. He was vaping something that smelled like super fake strawberry. I was hoping he wouldn't go into the park, but he did. We walked like that in the park until I noticed that there was a hockey game going on. I decided I would go watch just to let him take some distance before I would keep going. As I was turning right to get to the outdoor ice rink, he turned left on a path that goes by a building. I was reassured that he wasn't going in the same direction that I needed to go. Still, I was a bit curious about the match so I watched for a minute or so before going back on my path. As I turned, my blood ran cold. The same guy that turned left was turning the other corner of the building. He just circled the building. If I had kept going instead of watching the hockey match, by doing this, he would have been behind me again. I was petrified, but I was still relatively safe because there were people around. The guy walked slowly as ever in the direction I needed to go, but I did not follow him straight away. I waited for a bunch of students to walk by and walked behind them. He was waiting by the park exit, checking his phone. When he saw the bunch of students and I, he walked away. Normal speed this time. I saw him turn right on a street, and I thought that was the end of it. Eventually I reached the subway station and started waiting for the bus. And then, I smelled a very familiar, potent strawberry smell. As I turned to look around, there was the guy with the hockey-themed hat, but he was with someone else, both of them staring at me. When the bus arrived, I was shaking, and it was not because of the cold. They both got on the bus with me, and other passengers. I told the bus driver about what happened. Where I live, past 9pm, Women can ask a bus driver to be dropped off alone at a bus stop, making sure no one can follow her. And that is exactly what the bus driver did. I had the bright idea to get out one stop early, and I walked in the opposite direction from my home and waited for the bus to leave. I turned around to wave at the bus driver as a way of thanking him, and I saw the two guys banging on the middle door. The bus driver locked them so the doors wouldn't open, I took that bus almost every night, and I had never once seen those guys, nor have I seen them around my house. But here they were, banging on the door, 
and although I couldn't hear them, I could clearly see them yell at the bus driver. When the lights finally turned green and the bus left, I rushed back home, faster than I ever had in the snow. The next night after school, I was too nervous to use my shortcut through the park, so I took the long way around. I got to my bus safely, but what I saw on that ride scares the living hell out of me. At the bus stop that I had been dropped off the previous day were the two guys. One with the hockey-themed hat. They didn't get on the bus. My first thought was that they were waiting for me and not the bus. Luckily for me, this was not my stop. Maybe I was paranoid, and all this could be chalked up to a strange series of coincidences, but I was scared to get on that bus, and I still am today. I moved in with my boyfriend since then, but the shortest way to our house is through the park. I still take the long way around at night. We are university students in Cape Town, South Africa, so when we aren't just trying to get through the semester, we like to let our habits get the better of us and go out for drinks. On this night, we had just finished what felt like an extra long day at university and decided to head out to a bar about five minutes from campus for some much needed stress relief. The evening was going well, although a bit slow. It was enjoyable with everyone having a drink and getting a bit restless. So me being one of the more outgoing ones in the group, I suggested we head to a pool bar not far from where we were. Everyone agrees and we go get our stuff. We all jump in my car and we go to the bar, but being a Thursday night, parking was scarce. I finally managed to find a spot about a block away from the bar, but it was in a secluded side street. I should also mention that this bar is in one of the sketchier parts of town, but it's normally quite safe due to the amount of nightlife associated with being so close to a university. We walked to the bar and no one really felt uneasy, nor did anything happen to make us feel that way, which was quite surprising. After a few hours of some good pool and just relaxing, we decided it was time to grab dinner before restaurants close as being in South Africa means that most restaurants, even the fast food ones, close really early at around 7 or 8 p.m. in order to comply with the curfew. We decided to stop at the pizza place below the bar to grab some food before we all decided what the plan was for the end of the night. So because our group was so large and the pizza place being so small, we decided to have those getting food go inside while the others who weren't ordering anything would just wait outside on the street. This was an easy decision, as the pizza place had a massive open window with a built-on counter so we could still all talk to each other. This is where things started to get a little weird. While we were waiting for our friends inside the pizza place to come out, this massive white van pulls up past us and stops. The driver wasn't an intimidating looking dude. He was skinny, looked to be about average height, with shoulder length blonde hair, and a pretty normal looking guy for the area we were in. He calls to me and asks if I think his van could fit in a parking spot just behind him. For perspective, this parking spot could probably fit like a small hatchback, maybe. This dude is driving a full long size panel van. This makes me kind of uneasy, as I thought that as a driver of a car, you should know where your car can definitely not fit. And this was one of them. I explained to him that I don't think it was even worth attempting. He responds, telling me that he has lost his faith in his ability, and I should come stand behind the van and direct him in. This gives me major red flags, and after a few back and forths, he just pulls the emergency brake up and sits and stares at my friends and I for what felt like eternity. He then thanked us and drove off. This sparks my friends to come outside from the pizza place as they just saw what happened and were very confused. We were all kind of weirded out but think nothing of it. And everyone eats their pizza 
and then we try to decide what the plan is for the last hour or two we have left before curfew cuts things short. Most of us decided that's where the night was going to end, as we're all kind of weirded out by the guy in the van. A few others decided they were going to stay and just take an Uber home. A little later in the evening, with our group number cut down to four, we decided to walk back to the car and just head home. When we left the pizza place, a homeless person called us and was insisting we had nothing to worry about regarding the guy in the van, which didn't help anyone's nerves. We then decided to head to the car, but as soon as we turned the corner to approach the side street where the car was parked, we see the van man again. This time, not quite as happy as he seemed in his earlier encounter. I made a cheeky comment about him, finally finding a parking spot he could fit in as we passed. I turned around to see if he was still looking. He was, but as we turned the corner of the side street with the car, I saw it, and my heart sank. The van, horribly parked, half on and half off the sidewalk, the back door slightly open. Upon seeing this, I turn around, and I see the van man is now walking towards us. But he said something that confused me at first, but immediately made sense after. He said, hey, please just watch my car which confused me. But when he said that, four men got up from leaning on the wall next to it and began following us. My friends and I were slightly ahead of them, so we were trying to discuss the game plan because it was obvious if we did nothing, something horrible was going to happen. My friends start walking faster and I remain at the same speed, frantically searching my pockets for my car keys, all while shouting at my friends to wait up and asking what the rush was, all in hopes that the guys behind us who were gaining on us were oblivious to us knowing they had sinister intentions. As soon as the car came into view, we booked it, jumped in, and drove away. But we were only seconds from not being that lucky. After locking the car doors, I saw the men surrounding the car. I managed to get us out, and looking back in the mirror, I saw a fifth man by the van at the bottom of the street. I still have no idea what their intentions were that night, if it was to rob us or just beat us up, or worse. I really don't like to think about how lucky we were that night. I ask that when you're out, no matter how innocent an interaction with someone can seem, always pay attention to the little things. I went to a college in a historic, mid-sized city in Florida, and at the time, I lived in a duplex downtown, maybe three blocks from campus. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent-sized area, with large, historic homes near me. This story takes place around three years ago. A little backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but this specific night, only one of my roommates were home. We knew the girls that lived upstairs, but only really spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was to us for them to keep the main front door locked, and they did a good job doing so. So me and my roommate are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked and smoked a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock at the front door and quickly realize the girls upstairs had ordered pizza. Later on, it becomes evident that they never locked the front door after receiving their pizza. So we finally go to sleep in our own rooms, and since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I fell asleep, I woke up to a man standing over my bed as soon as I realize I'm not dreaming, I notice that he is quickly moving my phone and computer off my bed and moving my comforter, trying to get into my bed. I start to ask him who he is, what he's doing here, and just generally confused, as I was slightly high from before I went to sleep. 
the only thing he said to me multiple times was that he was just trying to get into bed. At this point I begin to panic as my mind obviously goes to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random tinder guy over and that he had gone to the wrong room. But the more I questioned him, all he had to say was, I'm just trying to get in bed. I own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I had accidentally left them on the shelf that the guy was standing in front of, so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing that I needed to act quickly, I blurted out, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get out now, I will scream, and they will all be here within seconds. Luckily, that was all it took to scare him off. I don't know if he had brought something with him or if he stole something from me, but I saw him grab something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left my room, I shut the door and locked it, and I tried to find my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere, but then quickly realized that between my room and the front door is the room of my friend that was home. As scared as I was, I was terrified that guy had maybe gone into her room, so I grabbed my stun gun and a pocket knife, counted to three, and ripped open my door. I ran into my roommate's room, and she was fast asleep. There was no evidence of this guy. I told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure I wasn't dreaming. I began to question myself, until I walked out of her room and saw that our front door was wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone, and finally, I found it hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I had left it. That sent chills up my spine, as I immediately knew for a fact that someone had been in my house and in my room while I was sleeping, and long enough to hide my phone, which only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at that point believed me. We barricaded ourselves in the room and called 911. Within minutes, there were police cars swarming our street and yard, and they quickly yelled for us to leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen police officers came running in. They searched every inch of our apartment and woke the girls upstairs. They searched their apartment to ensure the man had left. The officers then had me write a statement, and I gave them a description of the man. And to this day, I've never heard a single thing about the case. I feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of the situation, but the thought of his intentions terrifies me. And additionally, the fact that he was never caught scares me, as I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear that I did. I will add, there is a chance that he was on drugs or mentally ill, and possibly had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I will never know, and my mind will always assume the worst. For a little context, my first semester of freshman year in college, I had history class at 9am. The class had at least 50 people, but I literally knew no one. I was fine with that. The lectures were actually interesting. We had minimal homework and the class wasn't hard at all. I sat towards the back of the class. So one day out of nowhere, I got an email on my college email account. It was some random guy that was like, Hey, I'm Joe, and I'm in your history. How do you like the class? Or something along those lines. I thought this was really creepy, because not only did I have no idea who Joe was, but also... Who uses a school email to start talking to someone? I got his name from the email account and decided to look him up on Facebook, thinking maybe I knew this guy or something. That's when I discovered that about two weeks before the email, he had requested to be my friend on Facebook, and I hadn't responded because I had no idea who he was. He had also messaged me 11 times and Facebook called me. Okay, what the hell? So I spoke to my roommate and her friend that night about it. They basically told me I should just message him and tell him I'm not interested. I Facebook messaged him back and basically said, No thanks. He seemed to get the message and it was fine. I looked for him in the next class on Monday 
and realized he sat about four rows in front of me, near the middle of the class. He would fully turn to stare at me throughout the class, and I considered telling the professor because he made me feel so uncomfortable. Thankfully, we only had a couple of weeks left. After the class was over, I figured I wouldn't see him again, and I didn't really think about him. I had a math class on the other side of campus next semester. I could have taken the trolley, but I normally like to take the 15-ish minute walk to get there. One day as I walked into the building, I saw Joe walking out. I basically opened the door to go in as he was standing there, about to leave. He didn't even move and just stared at me, waiting for me to walk past him. He was easily six foot tall and huge. His demeanor really made me feel weird, but I pushed past him and went to class. When the class was over, I walked out to head back to my dorm when I saw Joe just hanging around the building, alone. I started walking, and he began walking like six feet behind me. Okay, weird, but maybe he's just got somewhere to be. After a couple of minutes, I got more and more nervous about him, and I spotted two of my roommate's friends in front of me, walking to their dorm as well. I literally inserted myself into their conversation, and I was just like, Hi, I know you barely know me, but please walk with me, I'm being followed. And they were really cool about it. He continued to follow us until we came to a crosswalk. He walked past us, turning to stare directly at me. And the look he gave me freaked out the two girls I was with so much that they suggested we take the long way back to our rooms. We did, and despite the fact that we should have seen him again on this path, we didn't. The weirdest part of all of this is why was he hanging around the building? He had been walking out as I went in. My class was over an hour, so he should have been long gone by then. The only restaurant on that side of campus was closed by then, and if he had a class, he would have still been in it. I got out a couple minutes early, so was he just waiting for me to leave? I honestly don't really want to know. So this situation happened about a year ago. It's important to note that I'm also a girl, so this was a scary and potentially dangerous situation for both of us. One night after work, just after it had become dark, my girlfriend stopped at the Walmart neighborhood market down the road. Which, by the way, is next to a big highway. I made a last minute run to the bank. Right as I'm pulling out of the bank, I get a text from her about thinking that she's being followed. I asked her for more details, and also told her not to leave the store, and that I was going to drive up to the front door, and either watch her get into a car, or have her get into mine if she needed. She told me that there were two men that she kept seeing in every single aisle, usually behind her. They were very clearly staring at her each time, and watching her very closely. She thought she was just being paranoid, but I told her again to trust her gut and that she should let a worker know about the situation, and even call the police, because it wasn't worth the risk. Before I had made it all the way there, she texted me she was in the checkout. She said the guys followed her there, and then went to a self-checkout near her, but with no items. They quickly grabbed some gum from the shelf, and put it into a Walmart sack. But they just stood there, taking forever to cash that item out, and kept watching and waiting for her to finish. I told her to check out as slow as humanly possible. I finally arrive. She had just texted me that they finally took their bag and exited the store. However, right as I pulled up, I saw two guys. They perfectly matched her description of them. They were hiding in a little cutout near the entrance. They were just standing there and kept peeking around the corner at the front door every single time someone exited. I knew they were looking for her. I pulled my car forward, right in front of them, and rolled down my window, and just stared into their souls. I did not look away. I wanted to make sure that even though they didn't know I had anything to do with her, that I got a very good look at their faces and was watching them. I messaged her and told her not to return to her car. 
I told her to get straight into mine. Right then, they started walking off. However, they had to have been following her since she arrived, because the next thing they did was walk straight to her car. Her car is very unique and stands out. They dropped the bag with the gum on the ground on the way to her car. One of them went between her car and the one next to it and just squatted down by the trunk. And he just waited there. The next one walked over to a white work van with painted windows and no license plate. He spoke to someone that was in the driver's seat. While this was happening, one of the cars next to hers left. They then moved the van into that spot. I called her and told her to go straight to my car and not to even look at hers as they were waiting for her with a van. She comes out with groceries. They then see her and squat down. We quickly loaded them up and she gets into my car. The men stood up and walked to the van. I pull away and try to go around the van so I could get a number plate, but of course, there is none. I drove in a totally different direction from home, and we drove around for a while. I wanted to make sure no one was following us, and also to give them time to leave her car alone. I wanted to call the cops, but she was convinced we were just seeing things that weren't there, like taking coincidences and making them into something else. Obviously looking back, after having talked in depth about both of our experiences and the things we witnessed, we definitely should have called the cops. I regret this. I've since seen the van, with the same two guys driving, back in the neighborhoods behind the Walmart. I was turning onto the street they were taking off of, still no license plate. But their van had more things on the exterior to make it look like a work van, Things like the ladder on the roof, etc. I got so creeped out that I quickly tried to get away, just in case they turned around and tried to come for me. So I floored it home again. I thought about calling the police, but what am I going to say? Yeah, there's two men driving away from a neighborhood with a work van. Go and get them. They don't even take most things seriously, even when it results in something actually happening. I truly hope that there is a valid explanation for all of these actions and that I just came to a conclusion that was not the case and was being dramatic. But I don't know, like maybe they waited at the front because they didn't see their buddy with the van and thought he might just be inside of Walmart and were just waiting for him. Her car is very cool, so maybe they just liked it and were looking at it. Maybe they just wanted to steal parts off her car. Maybe there's an explanation, but probably not. It doesn't explain them following her or getting gum in a bag to just drop it in the parking lot. Luckily, I haven't heard of any kidnappings coming out of that Walmart, but who knows? I haven't been digging for it, but I do know that I'm extra cautious now and I try not to go out past dark. I also scan the parking lot for the van before I go in. But normally, I just do the curbside pickup now. My girlfriend does the same thing. My girlfriend and I have been dating for about three years, and I have never had an experience that was as close of a call as this. We are mostly nocturnal creatures, especially when we used to work the night shift at a factory together. To us, midnight used to be like noon, and we loved going to the store at around this time because we are usually two of ten people in the place, including staff members. One night, a year or so ago, we were doing our normal Saturday night shopping at around midnight when I got the strangest feeling not even five minutes into our journey. It constantly felt like we were being followed, but every time I would look, there was no one there. I eventually wrote this off as paranoia and started to have a good time and make an adventure out of our trip. We were finishing up on the non-grocery side of Walmart, taking the long straightaway towards the groceries so we can get down to business on getting food. 
My girlfriend was telling me about her latest attempts in statistics of her shiny hunting in Pokemon Ultra Sun when I finally noticed him. I heard a slight clicking noise and looked back casually to see a man pushing a bicycle alongside him, walking a few steps back. It was brand new, like he pulled it right off the rack as he walked past and was staring at me, and I got a bad feeling. I positioned myself on the other side of my girlfriend so that I was between him and her purse, which raised red flags to her. I told her to keep walking and act natural, and who I saw. A couple of minutes go by, and the man makes this mad dash around the medium chip display towards us and stopped dead when he saw I didn't flinch. Now, I'm not exactly a muscular guy, but I suppose my six foot four stature made him nervous about what I was capable of since I was wearing heavy winter clothing. I never broke eye contact until he turns around and walks back in the direction he was following us from and then disappeared. For about 30 minutes, we shopped around wondering if I was still just being paranoid. And we disregarded it as much. That is, until we were checking out. As I finished checking out the groceries and got ready to pay, I saw the same man on the bicycle with the front basket full of food and a woman's purse in his right hand, pedaling as hard as he could. An employee made an attempt to grab him, but he was too slow, and the man got away. We then asked a nearby employee if we just saw what we think we did and told them what happened with us. And they said they weren't allowed to tell us anything and threatened to charge us with trespassing if we didn't leave immediately. To this day, I have no idea if they ever caught the guy or got the purse back. We still joke about this and our family says that it's possible that I could have died if I fought back. But I figured if he had a gun, he wouldn't have hesitated like he did when he finally got up to us. This happened a few years ago. I am a female. I had gone to Walmart to buy diapers for my daughter, who was about 18 months old at the time. After I was finishing, getting her strapped into the car seat after our shopping trip, a woman approached me. She told me that her van was out of gas and asked if I could spare a few dollars. I told her that I was sorry, but I didn't have any cash on me. She then asked if I could come over with her to a nearby gas station and use my credit card. At this point, I notice a seedy looking van a little ways off in the distance with a man sitting in the front seat, watching us like a hawk. I knew that I had to get out of there. I told her, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. And I got in my car and locked the door. Sure enough, she walked over and got into that seedy van. I took the long way home and made sure they weren't following me. I was creeped out, but I soon forgot about the encounter. Fast forward three to four months. I see a news story about an attempted abduction of a woman in a Walmart parking lot. They show the mugshots of the individuals that were responsible, and it was the same couple that I had encountered months before. My blood ran cold. So, I was at Walmart with my mom. She just got off work and was going to drive home with me, but we needed to grab some stuff first. I wanted to look at skincare stuff, and my mom needed to get toothpaste. So she left me. Basically, next to the pharmacy in the little corner, there's the skincare stuff. It's mostly closed off by the makeup shelves as well, so it isn't easy to get back there without actually walking back. I was looking at foaming cleansers or something like that when this guy with a beard, sunglasses, and a mask walked into the aisle. I'm a female and 15, and I look quite young, so obviously being alone with a man made me a little scared. I just moved slightly away from him 
but he seemed engrossed in the skincare, so I let my guard down. After I was halfway through reading the side of the bottle, he walked up next to me, specifically in the way of the way out. I was like a deer in headlights. He started asking me if the skincare stuff worked, and I tried to be polite. Maybe he was just curious. I told him about how different products are there for different skin types, though, halfway through my little lecture, he was all up close to me, and I was getting scared, so I started looking ahead and refusing to look at him. I was about to pull out my phone and say something to my mom, but it was dead. So I turned towards him and looked behind him, looking at the single customer in the makeup aisle, trying to somehow signal that he was a stranger, and I was scared. He got really close to my face as I was doing this, and then I said that I didn't need this face wash because my skin is great, which was a bit of a lie because I have chronic acne. And then at this point, my mom pulls a card up. I look over to her, and when I look back to him, he is running off from me. I immediately started crying and telling my mom what happened, and that I was so scared he was going to kidnap me or hurt me. She decided it was time to leave after that, and we paid for the stuff and left. Though I have to admit, I'm still really shaken up. I'm only 15, and this is actually my first experience with men being creepy. I definitely didn't handle it right. About two months ago, I was in Walmart with my daughter, who is now seven, and my son, who is two. I was looking at clothing in the women's section when I noticed a man, who was roughly 25, had come into the clothing department. He was pretending to look at the clothes, but stayed near us. I went to a different spot, and he followed. This happened about three times. At that point, I confronted him and I said, can I help you with something? He stumbled out the words, no, no. I didn't see him again after that. Stay aware, stay safe. This happened in 2019, around September. Me and my sister and her best friend were in Walmart shopping and I was riding one of those scooter things because I have breathing problems. Now I love Halloween and Walmart had put out the Halloween stuff like costumes and makeup. We had already looked through the stuff when we first got there but I wanted to look again before we left. So me and my sister and her friend kind of split up I drove down the kind of dark coaster mile once more, and as I was browsing, a man who looked way older than me walks up and goes, You single? in a kind of whispering tone. I've never been hit on, so I'm kind of freaking out, and I nervously say, No, I have a girlfriend. I thought he would leave me alone if I said I'm into girls. Well, it didn't work. He says, The devil is a lie in the same whisper tone. I start backing up out of the aisle while he's still talking. Me, you, and your girl can still hang out. I answer with, she wouldn't like that, while nervously laughing. And right after, he mimics my laugh and says, us three can chill together, why not? When my scooter finally pulls out of the aisle, I see my sister and a friend staring at us, so I kind of speed over to them. He walks away and goes straight into another aisle. I'm telling them what happened and that I'm creeped out and that we need to leave. My sister shushes me because he was in the aisle next to us. I finish telling them what happened. My sister followed and chased him down. She came back out of breath and told us that he was running around and checking every aisle. That creep was looking for me. He thought I was there alone. And the creepiest part is that when my sister said that she was right on his tail, he just disappeared. 
She thinks he might have run out of the emergency exit. So I was in Walmart, and I was in the aisle with the soap dispensers and things like that. When this bald man came up to me, he looked like he was in his 30s. He was wearing a black tank top and red shorts. He was pretty buff and tall and he had tattoos. So he approached me and said, Hey, do you go to Clemson? I live in South Carolina, and Clemson is a popular college school there. I said, No, I'm not. He responded with, Oh well, what do you do? I said to him, I'm still in high school. And then he said, Oh, what school do you go to? And my dumb self replied, Pendleton High School. He then started asking me if I was interested in some sort of army thing. I forgot the name, but I said, Oh, I'm just trying to figure out what I want to do and stuff. And he was like, Do you like blowing stuff up and things like that? And then my brain was going crazy at this point, and I said, Oh, I'm just trying to figure stuff out. Then he replied, You don't seem interested. Do you have some time to talk? I told him, no, I'm in a rush. Then he said he understood and wished me best of luck. During this conversation, I maintained eye contact and it was just like he was staring right through me, like he wasn't even looking at my eyes. I noticed him later on in the store as I was just trying to check out. It seemed like he was following me or something. He had the most creepy calm voice, like it was just off. He didn't have any ID or anything, and he didn't look like he was in the army. Also, I'm 18, and I'm fairly short. I've been told I look a lot younger than I am, like about 15 or 16, so I don't know if it was some predator thing. I am a young petite female, and I have a new EV. I haven't installed my charger yet, so I usually charge every night or every other night because I drive long distances. I have two spots I go to, the mall or Walmart. Tonight, I decided to go to Walmart since it's closer to my house. I noticed about two minutes after I got back in my car that a van pulled over. The guy inside attempted to talk to me but he looked like a creep, so I decided not to open my window. I noticed he didn't get out and didn't have anyone else with him. I felt observed and caught him staring at me a few times. I started to get scared when it reached over 30 minutes and my car was 85% done. The EV Go chargers have a small screen displaying the charge left and when he noticed my car was almost done, he started moving more and even opened his door. He was looking at the screen, then directly at me. At this moment, I was terrified. I had looked all over my car for anything that could be used as a weapon, and I had nothing. I was waiting for anyone to park near me and then unplug, but nobody was parking next to me or near me. I didn't know what to do. I started to dial 911 because I honestly feared for my safety. When he noticed that, he quickly turned around and got out of the car. When I saw him walk inside of the Walmart, I rushed out and left ASAP, before he walked out. I knew I had about five minutes, since the doors are one way due to COVID, and he would have to go around through the cashiers. When I got home, I watched the full recording of my cameras, it gave me the chills when I saw him staring straight at me from his window. You could tell he was up to no good. I'm currently 15, and this happened a few months ago when I was 14. I had started doing YouTube, and I decided I wanted to buy a microphone. I told my mom about it, and she said we could stop by at Walmart to see if they had any. Once we got there, 
I went with my younger brother to the technology section, but I couldn't find any microphones anywhere. I saw an employee nearby and walked over to ask him, Hello, do you guys have any microphones in stock? The employee then responded, saying my name, then saying that he would check, and then he started typing on his little work tablet. I was completely weirded out and looked down at my brother in shock. My brother also gave me the same look. I had never met this guy, and he somehow knew my name. Of course, since we were wearing masks, I couldn't see all of his face, but judging by the parts I could see, he didn't look familiar. After a couple of seconds of looking at his work tablet, he said my name again, and said that there weren't any microphones here, but that we could check online. I was so creeped out that I didn't even bother to ask him how he knew my name. But I said thank you, and as I started to walk with my brother, I heard him say no problem, and ending the sentence with my name. I even asked my mom, took her to where the guy was, and when we saw him, she didn't recognize him either. What surprised me is that every time he spoke, he either started his sentence with my name or ended it with my name, which was strange. I still see him whenever I go to Walmart, and I always try to avoid him. This happened a couple of months ago. I'm a female and I'm 19. I work as a maintenance worker at Walmart and I work the night shift, which is 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. I have to change all the outside parking lot trash and I usually do that at the beginning of my shift when there's still traffic outside from customers and day crew leaving. Last night though was different and I didn't get outside until about 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. There's absolutely nobody outside that I can see. I start collecting the trash, and when I get to the one furthest from the store, a white van I hadn't noticed before turns its high beams on, pointing straight at me. It's about 20 feet away, and technically not in the actual Walmart parking lot. This doesn't bother me too bad, and I keep going. Then, I hear a door open, and I look up to see a person get out of the passenger side door, and then proceed to get into the sliding back door of the van. This is where I start feeling uncomfortable. Next, the van turns on its hazard lights. I froze up slightly at this point, and just stared for a few minutes. Then, the hazards turn off, and whoever is in the driver's seat starts flashing a flashlight at me, as if they're trying to get my attention. I was already clearly staring straight at the van. I was frozen until the lights stopped flashing. Then I just got the rest of the trash and got out of there. I told my manager, even pointed out the van to him, but he said he can't do anything because they aren't in our parking lot. I have to work again tonight and I've decided to call the cops if it happens again. Whatever those people in the van were up to couldn't be good. In 2011, my uncle invited me on a trip with him and my two cousins. We stayed a night in Vegas and then rented an RV for a trip in Utah and Arizona. Our final destination was the Grand Canyon. We spent a few days driving around to all of the tourist destinations, such as Eagle Point. Our nights were spent in RV parks that we found along the way. On our final leg of the trip, we headed to the Havasupai Indian Reservation. We got some really awesome photos and went on a thoroughly interesting tour. On the last night, we were driving around looking for an RV park to sleep in. We didn't want to rough it on the side of a road because it would be freezing out and we needed to empty the sewage tank. Unfortunately, our phones were giving us problems due to poor signal. My uncle was tired of driving and he was determined that we would have to pull over. We took this opportunity to stretch out and stargaze. The stars looked beautiful in the night sky. We were in an incredibly rural, unpopulated area. There were hardly any other cars or people. 
As a result, there was no light pollution and the stars glowed intensely. On one side of the long dirt road was a steep hill with boulders and shrubs. On the other side, the canyon. To our surprise, the dark was broken by high beams coming towards us. A car was slowly cruising down the road. The driver pulled over next to us and got out. He was a Native American man, and he told us he was a local. His hat nearly covered his eyes, and his beard grew over his mouth. We greeted him respectfully and asked if he knew of any RV parks. He said that we were reasonably far from the tourist areas and that there were none over here. He asked us how we got here, and we told him that we were sort of driving aimlessly in hopes that we would find an RV park. He laughed and then started telling us about the part of the canyon that we were standing next to. He sounded like a tour guide, spewing out facts. He offered to take us down an unmarked trail that only locals hiked. He said it had beautiful, scenic spots. Beguiled by his backstory and knowledge, we agreed to follow him. He got some hiking gear from his car and urged us to gather some of our own. We climbed into the RV and gathered our stuff. As I put my boots on, I watched him circle the RV through the window. Once we were ready, he led us a quarter mile down the road. We reached his fabled location and he proceeded to shine his light off the edge of a cliff to show us the path. I knew this wasn't an official trail, but it didn't look like a trail at all. We followed him down an incredibly steep bank with tons of loose rocks. He led us around a few turns and through several tight caverns. We found ourselves on a big, flat rock and we stopped to take some pictures. He led us deeper and deeper into the canyon. Do you want to go to the bottom? He asks. It was dark and we were tired, so we declined. We kept following him for about 10 minutes. We saw a few birds eating a small animal along the way. It struck me that we were truly in the untouched wilderness. We were uncomfortably close to the cliff edge many times. My uncle grew a bit uneasy and asked him to lead us back. He agreed and then told us that he knew of a shortcut back up from where we were. He told us to wait there and then disappeared out of sight. We were all a bit nervous at this point because we had no idea where we were. We waited about 10 minutes, taking more photos to pass the time. Eventually, my uncle walked off in the direction the man left. My cousins and I were afraid to be alone, so we trailed him tensely. He came back and told us that he didn't see the man. We waited another 10 minutes before giving up. He's not coming back, my uncle told us. I began to wonder what could have happened to him. Did he fall? Did he get lost? Did he ditch us? I couldn't understand why he would have left us there. He seemed so friendly, and we were oddly eager to trust him. We started to hike back to whence we came. The problem was, nobody remembered exactly where we came from. The terrain was incredibly unsafe, and we realized that we could not navigate it on our own. My uncle called out a few times, but the only response was his echo. We found ourselves testing ridges that we were certain we hadn't come across before. Foot placement was key, as many rocks were wobbly. My little cousin started to cry, and we had to hold on to her jacket. It felt like we were almost lost in a labyrinth. My uncle remarked over and over that he knew it was a bad idea, but it was too late now. Since there was no real trail, there were no markings to help us. The only source of light came from our flashlights. I tried not to look over the ledge. We were incredibly high up. I didn't want to be in the back of the pack, but I wasn't prepared to lead either. I just wanted to be back in the RV. Our anxiety was building as the moon sunk. We joked that we could survive a night in the canyon since my cousin was an Eagle Scout. However, we were merely trying to take our minds off the situation. Finally, we found ourselves on the big flat rock. We recognized the series of caverns we crossed through and climbed back out. It was such a relief to be back on the dirt road. We walked towards our RV, 
Looking for the man as we staggered on, we came upon the RV, but the man's car was gone. He left us. We quickly put the pieces together. We were angry and felt incredibly foolish. As I got closer to the RV, I noticed the door was creaked open. I remembered locking it when we left. Immediately, tears began to build up in my eyes. I wasn't sure if the adrenaline had gotten the best of me, or if I truly had a reason to be afraid. Hold on, my uncle said, as he swung the door open. My cousins and I were too afraid to go inside, but we were not particularly content being outside either. My uncle took a few steps into the RV and blurted out, Guys, we have been robbed. We piled into the RV and froze. None of us wanted to venture too deep in. I began thinking of all the stuff I had stored in there. Our suitcases were thrown on the floor, and the clothing was scattered. My iPad was gone. My uncle's wallet was gone, my cousin's jewelry was gone, and my other cousin's phone was gone, amongst other things. I felt so violated. We were all quiet, and none of us slept. My uncle started the RV, and we drove off, looking for civilization. Fortunately, we had enough gas to make it back to the RV rental place. We phoned the police, and they filed out a report, but nothing ever came of it. My word of advice, if someone asks you to go to the bottom of a canyon, say no. This happened a couple of years ago, before New Year's Day. I planned to stay the night at a beach with two other female friends. I arrived a little later, when the bonfire had already started. We were having some beers when around 11pm, an RV came and parked right next to us. So you can have the mental image, we were parked about 100 feet from the entrance of our beach access. The guy and his family walked right over to our bonfire and they asked if they could join us. It was a man, a woman, and their two kids. We thought nothing of it, and told them sure. Of course I kept my guard up, I'll spare a lot of details, but later on, as the night progressed, this man mentioned how he was from Aruba. I happened to remember a story about an American girl named Natalie Holloway, who disappeared while vacationing with her friends, thanks to watching a Lifetime movie back in the early 2000s. I mentioned this, and instantly, the man's shift in energy changed. He started mentioning how he was a person of interest at one point for her disappearance. He said his name was Mr. Pink and that he ran a photo business back in Aruba. He started getting a little more worked up when talking about the role everyone thought he played. He said that family and friends had started distancing themselves from him. Well, the part where I basically said, screw that shit, was when he mentioned that even if he had been involved in her murder, he would have already been forgiven by God. Anyways, this guy at one point tried offering my friends and myself the opportunity to share his RV with his wife, while he slept somewhere else with the kids. I immediately got a strange vibe, considering he had talked about how much he enjoyed photography and filming. The next day, this guy threw a huge party on the beach, and it attracted a few hundred people. He wanted it to be his confession party. He admitted to a lot of people his involvement in her case, and I ended up reporting him to my local police department. When I was about 8 years old, my parents were going through a divorce, and my older sister and I used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long, ranch-style home on a corner, in a very nice neighborhood that's a 10-minute walk from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast-food restaurants. The streets are long, and lined with well-manicured houses cradled by big, scenic California Valley Hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandpa bought it as a fixed-robber many years ago, and the property value has since skyrocketed. As you can imagine, 
It's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside our house. Although my mom was especially protective all of our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated, and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop, and my sister would grab a Three Musketeers. Before we made our way back home, my sister was about 11 at the time, and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. Nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a couple dollar bills in our pockets. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the other side of the road that was opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade, like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I'd pass it. I was almost positive someone was living inside it, because, at times, I'd hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant in the same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door, and I'd always keep an eye on it for the fear of one day that it would swing open just as I came to pass by. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the front door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines in a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but I could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I'd steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and, unfortunately, had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. This time, I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long. And, while my mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged. And that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing I'd stopped following her but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt-caked scribbles until I could make out what looked to be a tiny, malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at that time, but now I can look back and say the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles, like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was contorted as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing that it seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about it. I'd never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body and my chest hurt with fear, but I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mom. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things that you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since, my ill feelings toward the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door. I thought about it every time we drove by, and about a month later, my mom once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. 
Now, I thought about telling my sister about what I'd seen on the way there, but she was older and braver, and I was terrified she'd make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright, sunny day, and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, maybe it'd go away. We walked past the camper, and it was thankfully uneventful. On the way back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened, and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about ten feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound, like a heavy backpack, and nervously, I half turned my head to look. A man with a long, unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved, one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arch of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering in our direction, like a zombie, with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years we'd spent living there, and I realized this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us, I choked out, my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again. The wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way. Speaking carefully under her breath, on the count of three, we race home. She told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply though, through the growing lump in my throat but every single cell in my body understood we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had the chance to. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three, but his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like you'd imagine in your nightmares. The fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to hear or see me. We ran so fast we didn't even have the breath to scream. And peering back behind me, about ten seconds later, I saw him running our direction with absolutely none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. That thought is terrifying, but I cannot rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house, and without looking behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past the excited dogs to get as deep in the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to grandpa at the table, and she gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, Running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't want to bring up what had just happened, like waking up from a nightmare you didn't want to talk about. I was desperate to go back to normalcy. 
I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity. And that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered this incident. As of now, I'm 25 and she's 28. Her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I'd like to believe that it is some innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they are rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I've never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets, as I would hate for any of the children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and the gas station, deliberately, due to the number of children walking around the area. I never saw the camper again a day or so after this. I'm not proud of how I handled this, and would encourage anyone who finds himself in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening in a way I can't forget. This happened to me when I was a kid, 10 to be exact. I grew up in a military family and I lived in the Middle East for a significant portion of my life. Because of this, we frequently traveled to different countries because of the low cost and proximity. On this particular vacation, we flew into Cairo, Egypt, for a long weekend. We only lived like two to three hours away. It was late at night, and we were staying at the Marriott Hotel, which had a taxi service that was supposed to pick us up. For some reason, our driver never showed so we were forced to find a regular taxi to take us there. And that took forever to find late at night. We finally found one that was offering us a pretty good deal and headed towards the hotel. Out of nowhere, another taxi t-bones us in the middle of the road, causing us to stop. There aren't really defined roads in a lot of Middle Eastern places, so it isn't really surprising that we got hit. The two drivers got out of their cars, each yelling that it was the other's fault, and it looked like they were going to fight. Eventually, they got back in the respective taxis and parted ways. My family and I were completely taken aback. We had been in Egypt less than two hours and have already had quite the adventure. We finally got to the hotel, exhausted, as it must have been 3am at this point. Our driver helped us get all of our bags out and get settled and told us that he felt so bad about the car accident that he offered to pick us up the next morning and take us to the Great Pyramids for a super cheap rate. My parents agreed and decided on a time for him to come, though I can't remember when. Flash forward to the next morning. Everyone is ready for the day, excited to see how crazy it was going to be. Our driver was waiting outside for us, leaning against the car like someone in an old movie. Right when he said he'd be there. I'm a blonde haired, blue eyed girl that had a deep tan line at the time. And being in Egypt, that was a rare sight. When the driver saw me in the daylight, he gave me the creepiest, most unsettling look that sent chills down my spine. Even as a ten year old. I knew something wasn't right with him. Nevertheless, we got in his taxi and then headed towards the pyramids. He continued to try and talk to me and joke around with me the whole ride. Something I found to be extremely creepy and bold since both of my parents were in the car. We get super close and there's an entrance that people can go through and walk the long distance to the pyramids. And there is an entrance that taxis can go through. 
you have to pay to see them. Strange, but true. Our driver kept making jokes about my blonde hair and blue eyes, and bringing up that he could get me into the pyramids for free, so my parents wouldn't have to pay the extra ticket price. We laughed it off, and my parents paid him, and said thank you, and then began to exit the taxi. I don't remember how it happened, but at some point, after I got out of the car, he did too, and directed me towards his trunk. I was confused, and thought we had forgotten something, so I stayed behind as my parents walked toward the gate, so I could get whatever I thought we had left. The driver opens the trunk, but there wasn't anything in it. He grabbed my arm and put a hand on my back, trying to push me into the trunk, and said, I'm getting you in for free, over and over again, as I resisted. Naturally, I freaked out, screaming out to my mom and dad to help me at the top of my lungs. Terrified. When they heard me and noticed I wasn't behind them, they started to sprint back to the car. When the driver heard me scream, he immediately let go of me, closed the trunk, and then drove away, just as my parents started to run to me. I was crying my eyes out, terrified out of my mind, knowing that a taxi driver tried to put me in his trunk and drove away the second that I screamed for help. It's scary to think what could have happened to me had he been stronger or more prepared or even faster. He is the reason that I'm still afraid of taxis, Ubers, lifts, any car service of that nature. This happened a number of years ago. It was the day I never expected to come. It changed my life in so many ways that I still feel like I cannot digest it. I want to start by saying a little bit about myself so you understand the context and why it was so weird and foreign for something like this to happen to me. I'm a fairly geeky guy. I love science fiction and video games. I worked at the time as a design engineer in a factory and spent most of my weekends with friends, hiking, playing board games, or watching movies. So you realize, nothing I did would attract the attention of the cartels. I do not have a lot of money, I just live a lower middle class type of life here in Mexico. But the real issue was my sister, who has a high ranking position in the public security area of politics. That is the reason I was targeted. It was an early morning on a Tuesday. I was on my way to work, which started at 6 a.m. I remember that day I took my dad's SUV because they were away on vacation, and I was supposed to pick them up at the airport after work that day. I lived about half an hour away from my work, so I left at about 5.25 every morning. When I was leaving, I saw a pretty shady SUV parked like a block away from my house. And honestly, after my sister took her job, I was more aware about things that I saw out of place. I felt a little bit paranoid because the weeks before it happened, I felt like someone was following me. So yeah, I passed this SUV and saw a guy on the driver's side with a baseball cap. I stopped for a bit, looked him straight in the eye, and he just looked down and covered his face. I honestly didn't think too much of it. My family had been telling me weeks prior that I was just overreacting and that no one was following me. So I thought it was just some random guy waiting for someone. I took off to work, and for me to get there, I have to go through a really ugly neighborhood, which is poorly lit and has a really bad reputation. I was in a two-lane street that's only one way. I was in the right lane at the time and saw a Jeep Cherokee just speed on by me on the left lane and then continue its way in front of me. When we arrived at the end of the street, I had to turn right to get to work and the Cherokee just completely stopped on the right lane in front of me with their blinker signaling to the left. I found it kind of weird, but I didn't want to be an asshole and honk at them and wanted to give them a few seconds to move. While I was waiting, an explorer 
came screeching on the left lane. It stopped next to me, and four guys came out of it with guns, and one with a baseball bat. The guy with the bat smashed my window and hit me in the face, while another put a gun to my head and said, This is real, asshole. Get out of the car. So, please understand that at that moment, I did not feel like they wanted to steal my car. I already knew they were trying to kidnap me. If I just knew they wanted the car, I would have given it to them, but I pieced everything together. The cars that I felt were following me at night every day. The guy just sitting in the SUV outside my place. And obviously, my sister's job. I knew that if they took me, it would be torture, followed by certain death. And if they really wanted to kidnap me, they wouldn't kill me. So I stepped on the gas. I smashed between the Cherokee and the Explorer and ran over one of the guys. I sped as much as the SUV would give me and honked so that I could make a lot of noise and people would notice. My hope was to get to my workplace, which had private security, and then call my sister so she could notify the police. With all the adrenaline on me, I passed the entrance of my work and tried to turn back, but I crashed on a corner. And at that moment, I honestly felt like my heart would come out of my mouth. Everything moved so slow, so I tried to calm myself down. I breathed. I looked in my mirrors to see if they were following me, and I saw no one. An empty street that was already lit by the morning dusk. The SUV was still working. I turned around, got to my work, yelled at the security guards to open the doors. I parked at the entrance, then got out of the car and called my sister. After that, I went inside. I talked to my boss about what had happened and then went to the restroom to clean the glass and blood off my hair and face. When I came out of the restroom and out of the parking lot, there were about 10 cop cars outside my workplace. My sister had told me to speak to a specific police officer and confirm his name. Everything went smooth and I felt safe and protected. After that, I moved into my sister's house, which had police guarding it. I have bodyguards that are with me every time I go out. This has cost me my job, relationships, and lifelong friendships. Everyone's afraid to hang out with you when they know you're a target for the cartels. And it's understandable, but it doesn't make me feel any less shitty. Investigations continued through the beginning of 2017. I later found out through security camera footage that there were three SUVs in total, with about 12 people trying to kidnap me. I found out that the cartel that was after me was one of the most powerful cartels in the world, and that the person who was in charge of investigating my case was killed. So, right now, I'm working for the Mexican government. It's a low-profile job, which does not pay much and does not attract too much attention. I've looked for ways to leave the country, but I do not have enough money or qualifications. I'm still living with my sister, with the people protecting me and my family 24 hours a day, and the guys who try to kidnap me are still at large. I'm trying to make the best of this situation. I've lost a lot of weight, I spend more time with my nephews, and I also recently got into a steady relationship. But honestly, I'm always on edge, and I feel like I'm in imminent danger. This happened a little while ago. My blood still runs cold when I think about it, and it was definitely out of the ordinary. My brother wanted to get a drink from a place we both love to go to. It was going to close soon and he had work to do, so I went by myself. It wasn't very late, but it was already dark, and my parents had drummed into me, since birth, about the dangers of walking alone at night. I was kind of nervous that day, even though I've done it many times before. So I went and got both drinks, and for some reason, I didn't get a bag. I was walking along with both hands full, which was a bad idea. 
As I was walking towards the street where my house was, I suddenly became aware of two men very near me. One was in front of me, wearing a maroon pullover, and the other was behind me, wearing a grey zipped up hoodie, with the hood pulled up. I only turned around for a flash of a second, so I couldn't describe his face to you. I was weirded out because I was walking between them, and I was beginning to feel uncomfortable. Like they were trying to corral me, and I was just telling myself that I was clearly overreacting. I came across a garage that was down an alleyway, and a black Subaru was coming out. I had time, so I crossed before they could reach me. The person inside clearly wasn't counting on me doing that, so they swung around in parallel park next to me, at most two feet away. So now, I was between three men and a wall. When I saw the door open, that was it for me. I bolted and didn't stop running until I reached my house. So yeah, black Subaru driver, grey hoodie, and maroon pullover. Let's not meet. This was quite a while ago, so bear with me. I was a sophomore in high school, finishing up band practice. It was the afternoon, maybe 7.30, and my friends and I are talking for a bit. We always chatted a bit after practice to avoid the crowd of people in the band hall. Plus, it just gave us a chance to unwind a bit. We see one of our friends, a freshman, talking to his dad and little sister. Now, none of us had ever spoken to his dad before. But we had heard things and knew he was a bit, shall we say, off. So that's why we didn't really question what happened next. My friend was chatting for quite a bit and finally the dad calls us over. Now the guy my friend is talking to looks remarkably like him. Same hair, same skin tone, very similar mannerisms. The guy is pretty greasy looking and he seems visibly uncomfortable and is obviously in a huge hurry to get out of there. You can see him shuffling about. He won't keep eye contact, and he seems to be eyeing us up in a strange way. But again, he's our friend's dad, and we knew he was a pretty strange guy, so we're not thinking much of the whole situation. He talks about how he wants us to play for him in a Cuban jazz ensemble that he's putting together. We're all pretty big into jazz at this time, and he mentions how we will all be getting paid for both practices and performances, and we're all very excited. He is very insistent on us leaving with him that moment to meet the rest of his bandmates, and my friends and I are all for it. Now, we haven't really been noticing the girl standing next to him this whole time. She's been very quiet, but she was very visibly uncomfortable this whole situation. Now our band director has noticed us by this point and walks on over. She was a very no BS, hard ass kind of person. She comes over and asks, who's this guy? Of course, I think she's mad because we've been taking our time putting our stuff away. So I just respond, oh, he's our friend's dad. He, right then, my friend cuts me off and says, what, he's not my dad. Now at this point, the man gets very irritated. Our director tells him he needs to leave, and this is when I start to notice the little girl more. First of all, she looks nothing like this man. This is pure conjecture on my part, but her skin color, eye color, hair color, none of them matched him. The man starts arguing with my director, saying how she can't talk to him like that. He seems like he's about to punch our director, by this point, he's attracted some attention, and our two other directors are here as well. The little girl is grabbing him by the t-shirt, trying to keep him back. She's not crying, but her voice seems like she's about to. She's pleading for him to stop, and asks him to please just go home. Now, this is the first time the girl has spoken to me, so this is when I first got a good look at her. She's very, very thin wearing a t-shirt and shorts, and is younger than us by maybe a couple of years. She has some pretty obvious bruises, 
and as mentioned above, looks nothing like her dad. Finally, it seems this man has given up. He's attracted quite a crowd, and he shuffles off. He doesn't really run to his car, but he goes off as fast as he can without actually running, tugging the little girl at his side. They call the cops, and they circle the area, looking for him or his car. But, no sign, and we never saw him again. After the incident, we spoke to our friend about it, and he mentioned how the little girl approached him first, and tried to get him to get in their car, before the man finally got off the car, and started to talk to my friend himself. I'm not too sure what was going on on that day. I don't know what would have happened to us had we gotten in that car with them as planned. But it definitely psyched me out for a bit. I had completely forgotten about the incident until I was browsing the subreddit and it came back to me. Finally, I'd like to add that since we met the friend in question's dad, they look remarkably similar, which is a weird coincidence. This happened when I was five, and my best friend was six. For the school layout, the building was L-shaped, the short end was not in use at the moment, and cars could stop to the right of the L or behind a short path. The road was pretty much in a square around the school, but only in the aforementioned places cars couldn't pull over. We were at school one day, and she did something that made me angry. She grabbed my colorful pens without asking. I wanted revenge. Shortly afterwards, recess started, and about halfway through, I saw my best friend walking towards the back of the short building, and I followed her, thinking she was going to do something fun. When I rounded the corner, I saw a man in a car, giving her candy through an open passenger door. Well, trying to. My childish mind thought, why doesn't the guy just step out to give the candy? Now he's holding it just outside of her reach, and she has to climb in the car to grab it, and his seat will get all dirty. My friend had one knee on the car seat, reaching for the candy now. I suddenly realized that this was the perfect time for my revenge. I'd stop her from getting the candy from this man. So, I yelled at her that she wasn't allowed to be this close to the road, and that I'd tell on her. This caused her to jolt back, and she ran away from the car, back to the school ground, taunting me with the fact that her passerby thought she was so pretty that he wanted to give her candy, but not me. Apparently a teacher saw me walk towards the road and was on her way to fetch me, so she was just around the corner from us when my friend started taunting me. She heard what was said and quickly ran the last few steps towards us, frantically asking us, did anyone get in a car? Did you see any classmates getting into a car? She was clearly panicked, and the car was long gone by now, having driven off when I yelled at my friend. My friend answered, No, the nice man just wanted to give me candy, and then she said she'd tell on me, so we ran back. I really wanted that candy. Are we in trouble now? The teacher escorted us inside, had all the teachers count heads, and then talked to the police that were called. Neither me nor my friend knew what was wrong at the time until her parents came to fetch her and gave her a stern talking to about accepting candy from strangers, saying things like, we've talked about this and we have plenty of candy back home. My mom was proud of me because she thought I listened to the stranger danger talks and protected my friend and I didn't correct her. A few years ago, my best friend and I were talking about our old school and this day came up. We both realized that if I hadn't been so obsessed with those pens, or if she hadn't asked before taking them, that she could have been kidnapped and suffered a pretty bad fate. She couldn't believe how stupid she was for thinking that a random guy would really offer candy to kids from his car, especially since her parents had warned her about strangers before. I just felt embarrassed for not recognizing the situation from the talks my parents gave me and being so focused on getting revenge. It took me a while longer to fully realize what could have happened to her. I don't know if the guy was ever arrested or did anything else. 
After this incident, my school started permanently posting a teacher as a lookout near the road. As far as I know, there were no more incidents at that school, and it was never really spoke of again. The official reason for the lookout teacher was to prevent students from running onto the road and getting run over. When I drove past last year, they had put a fence all around the school. I'm guessing it's because they finally realized that a fence is cheaper than paying a teacher an hour a day to just stand around. I grew up in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I was 12 years old, and let's just say I didn't have the easiest of upbringings. I was smoking, drinking, and staying out late around this time of my life. So I was bunking off of school. My mom was at work, and it was late morning time, around 11am. I wanted to buy some cigarettes, but as I was well under the legal age, I had to hang around outside the shop and ask strangers if they would take my money and purchase them for me. About a mile and a half from my house, there was a little shop called The Spar. It was on a fairly busy road. A row of hedges lined one side, with a gap that led into a field beyond, and houses on the opposite side. So I was standing maybe ten paces from the shop, waiting for people to walk past so I could ask them to purchase my cigarettes. I usually second-guessed if they would be willing by how they looked. I asked a lady, maybe mid-forties, shoulder-length blonde hair, black business trousers, pink elbow-length jumper, looked like she smoked, and she said no. I asked a guy maybe mid-fifties, shaved brown hair, he was wearing blue jeans and a white shirt, he ignored me. So I was getting desperate by this point, and I decided upon asking anybody that came by. Then, I see a rather disheveled looking man coming up the road towards me, past the row of hedges. He was wearing dirty dark brown suit trousers, a buttoned up dark brown, dirty velvet jacket. He had a black bowler kind of hat on, and he kind of limped a little as he walked. As he got closer to me, and as I was trying to suss out if he looked like the type of person who would purchase a 12-year-old cigarettes, I noticed that he was probably homeless and possibly in his late 50s to early 60s. But I thought, hey, he probably smokes too. I'll ask him. As he approached me, I gave him the usual line. Excuse me, mate. Would you please go into that shop and get some cigarettes for me? He stopped and thought for a second, then said, how old are you? I lied. I'm 15, almost 16. Then he said, All right, which ones do you want? And he held out a really dirty hand. I gave him my money and asked him to get me 10 sovereign. I had the exact change. He goes into the shop and I'm waiting outside excited. I'm finally getting my cigarettes and can go home and chill out before I have to leave the house again to make it look like I've just got home from school. He comes out and gives me 20 sovereign. I am miffed to say the least and say, but I only gave you enough money for 10. And I started panicking because I didn't have any extra money to give him. At this point, he hooks my arm in his, very tightly holding my arm firmly to his side and starts walking back towards the hedge-lined road all the while he's telling me how I can make it up for him, not having the extra money for the cigarettes. I'm kind of stunned at this point, and my mind is blank. I guess I was in some kind of shock. He leads me through the gap in the hedges and into the field, all the while talking non-stop, still briskly walking with my arm locked in his side. He's telling me how I can come to his house and help him fix the roof tiles. I'm still in silent shock. The field is huge, and I can see it leads into more fields and more fields. I can hear the cars behind me getting more distant. I can't see any houses for miles, there's just fields. He's still talking, but I'm not taking in what he's saying. My mind starts to race. I finally realize that something about this isn't quite right, and I have to get away. As he is walking, still holding my arm, 
I suddenly and violently pull back with my arm straight. It slides my arm out of his very quickly, and he goes flying forwards and lands in a heap on the floor. I take one big step backwards. I'm terrified at this point, but still in shock. I can't speak. He's lying on the ground, groaning and holding his leg, like he's in a lot of pain. Why'd you do that for? You've really hurt me. Help me up. Help me up. He's holding his leg and holding his hand out for me to help him up. I'm frozen. My mind is racing so fast. I'm looking at this disheveled man right in the eye, laying on the ground, groaning like he's in pain. But something about the situation didn't sit right with me. My gut was telling me to run. Don't help him up. I bought you those cigarettes, didn't I? I helped you out. Why'd you do this? You've hurt me. Help me up. I take another step backwards, all the while looking into his green eyes. All of a sudden, he stops groaning and asking for me to help him up. He points his finger at me, looking me right in the eye, and says, You're a smart girl. It was like an electric shock ran through my body, and I turn and run. I don't look back. I just run as fast as I can. When I've gotten off the hedge-lined road and turned into the next road, I slow as I'm out of breath. I start bawling my eyes out, and I'm shaking uncontrollably. I keep checking behind me. I catch my breath, and I don't stop running until I get home. Least to say I was terrified that I'd bump into that man again, and I never tried to buy cigarettes from that shop ever again. When I was 17 to 18, I was driving home from a friend's house after a movie marathon. It was around 1am when I left and a decent drive. Not quite halfway, my gas light came on. I had a few creepy catcall experiences at gas stations and was a little paranoid stopping that late in the middle of nowhere as a 100 pound teenage girl. In the end, I think if I wasn't so cautious, I would have been kidnapped or killed. The first gas station I came across was well lit and in a pretty open space. I drove up to the pump and looked around my car mirrors before getting out. As I was starting to pump gas, this normal looking guy comes out of the gas station shop and starts smoking a cigarette. The pump kept clicking off and not working. So I started messing with it, trying to get it to pump. This guy starts watching me, laughing. I assumed he was just laughing to himself, watching a teenage girl trying to pump gas. After maybe getting a quarter of a gallon, I gave up and moved to a new pump. After this point, if I didn't do absolutely everything I did, I would have been screwed. When I got back into my car, I locked my doors just to drive to another pump. I checked all of my mirrors before getting out or shutting off my car again. I had an old 90s Beetle that didn't always start right away. That's when I saw the guy walking up to my car. He was smiling, walking up to the driver's side window. Not wanting him next to me, I rolled down the passenger side window. He paused for a moment and smiled to himself and then walked to the passenger side window. He stuck his head all the way inside my window to talk to me. He said, Hey, I know this seems really weird, but I promise I'm not a creep or anything. My car broke down, and I need a ride home. It's just half a mile up the road, and he points to a red SUV. And I said to him, Sorry, but I don't know you. And his response was, Oh no. I totally get it. I thought it was pretty weird as I was walking up here, but it's only half a mile up the road. I'm totally stranded. I said to him, I wish I could help you, but I really don't know you. And then he said to me, yeah, I got you. If you had a truck or something, I'd offer to ride in the back. I firmly said, sorry, no. 
All of a sudden he looked pissed. He yanked at my car door, but I had locked it before. Then he reached my inside door handle through the window. My car was still running. I slammed it into first and peeled out as he opened the door. The car taking off slammed it shut and I sped off. I called the police after I got away. They looked at the gas station cameras and right after I left, he got into his red SUV and drove off. If I hadn't locked my doors the second time, I would have been fucked. If I let him come to the driver's side window, he could have grabbed me. If I had shut my car off, I wouldn't have been able to drive off in time. If I didn't double check my mirrors, I would have been outside my car when he came up to me. This is one of my earliest memories, so it's a little bit foggy. There are some parts I remember vividly though. At the time, I had no idea what was happening, and it wasn't until a few years ago that my mom and older sister told me what danger I was in. So I was around four, and my family, which consisted of my mom, my dad, my older sister, me, and my younger sister, were headed to New Mexico for a funeral. This is where the specific part of the trip gets foggy. The service had just ended, and we were outside the church building. All of a sudden, I remember being in the front seat of some old lady's car, with my younger sister in the back. I remember looking up, and seeing that she had decorative covers over the pull-down shades. They were a deep blue, with constellations, and those stylized suns and moons with faces on them. Then I remember my mom getting out of the car, and being really angry about it. At the time, I thought she was angry with me. That's about where the memory ends. About 12 years later, I was thinking about those really pretty shade covers. So I asked my mom, who was the lady in the car at the funeral? My mom and older sister both looked at me and were like, Dude, uh, she almost kidnapped you and your little sister. My mind was blown. My older sister recounted what happened. Apparently, she literally used the I have candy in my car trick. Once my sister saw her two younger siblings get in the car with a stranger, she went and got our parents. Every so often, I think about what could have happened if my mom didn't get us out of there. How would I have grown up, if at all? I am, and always have been, a very introverted, anxiety-ridden kid. I always imagined the worst of the situation, but this time, it was worth it. My cousin had persuaded me to meet her older boyfriend and his friend at Pizza Center. After reaching there, I found out that her old boyfriend was in college, and was 20. My cousin and I were 16 at the time. I got really anxious and wanted to leave, but I couldn't because my cousin started blackmailing me and wouldn't let me leave. After 30 minutes, our pizza arrived. It was at that point that I realized that the janitor of the pizza store was staring at me. I stared in the opposite direction and thought to myself, what a creep. My cousin's boyfriend took out four bottles of coke from his bag and gave one to each of us. I noticed the seal on my bottle was broken, and I, not thinking much about it, glanced at the janitor, and he was shaking his head vigorously, and I finally understood what he was trying to say. I asked the boyfriend about where he got the bottle from, and they all laughed and said, duh, from the counter. By that time I was so annoyed that I ran to the counter and shouted at them, asking, why would they sell a broken seal bottle to a customer? And before they could say anything, I heard someone shouting, Hold them and do not let them go. I turned around and saw that the boys and my cousin were trying to storm out of the place, and two police officers holding them down. I got so confused and so lightheaded that I collapsed on the spot. Two female employees of the store 
picked me up and put me on a chair, and I made the best decision of my life and called my dad. The whole story that we found out after was that my cousin, her boyfriend, and his best friend tried to drug me so they could take me to my boyfriend's house and kidnap me and ask my father for money, which, to be honest, is the dumbest plan ever. Like how would they even take me out of the mall, which the pizza center happened to be in, after I was unconscious? Anyway, the janitor heard their master plan when the boys were in the restroom, which prompted the janitor to inform the store manager, and them calling the police. That is why our order came late. He saved me from being drugged, and I thought he was a creep. My aunt, who was a single mother, tried to disown her daughter, but later took her in and had her go to therapy. The guys went to jail for a year and a half, and I don't know what happened to them after that. And also, I just want to say that I still meet the janitor when I go to the mall. He is a good friend and not a creep. In 2020, I was in the second year of graduate school. Even before the pandemic, many of my classes were online instead of in person. Normally, this was not a problem, but since my parents lived in a rural area, I had to commute to use the school's internet for my schoolwork. When COVID hit, all of my tests had to be taken online and the literal 3 megabytes per second my parents got on their satellite internet connection would not be good enough to help me with my schoolwork. If my university were to lock down and send the students home, I would have to withdraw for a semester. Since this was not an option, I began searching for apartments in the smaller college town. After a short search, I was surprised to find an opening at a student complex three miles from the campus. Not having any options, I signed a lease and moved in the next week. Eventually, my predictions came true, and the university locked down. I felt extremely lucky to have one of the few coveted spaces in town. Even as I walked into the office to get my keys, there were literally people crying on the steps. I genuinely felt bad for them, whatever their situation. I thought I had dodged a bullet. Little did I know, things were about to take a turn for the worse, fast. The apartment was very poor quality, but it was the cheapest rent in town. It was all my stipend could cover, so I was happy to have it. However, the lack of a security deposit and the ability to pay your rent up front meant that, unfortunately, desperate people started to move in. About five months into lockdown, there seemed to be very few students left living there, and many of the remaining residents seemed to be in their 30s or later. I heard a lot of rumors about drug dealing going on in the complex, but wrote it off because every college except BYU and Liberty has a lot of weed culture. Eventually, however, people started to find syringes in the landscaping, and the gravity of the situation became more obvious. Rumors continued to circulate, but I wrote them off. That was until one summer afternoon, when I was riding home on my bike from Whataburger. My apartment was in one of the rear buildings of the complex, so I had to ride through the parking lot to get to my door. As I pulled through, I noticed four or five police vans parked in front of the building. It looked like a massive drug bust, so I called my friend Mike over to come take a look at the situation. He lived across from me, so it was a quick walk for him to come over. We watched the commotion from my balcony for an hour, speculating on what it could be. We both agreed that one of the dealers was probably busted and was on his way to prison. That was until we saw men in dress shirts and ties walking out of the complex wearing surgical gloves. We saw on the news the next day that the man living in the apartment was murdered in broad daylight after walking out of his apartment. Supposedly he was shot while exiting and died on the way to the hospital. We never found out why 
and I don't think that the police ever caught the person who did it. I don't know if they had a suspect. All I know is that I was glad I was out when all of this was going on. At the very least, I could have witnessed something that would have scarred me for life. I've since moved on into another, nicer complex in the city, and I don't have to worry about such things. Take it back to 2007-2008. I was 16 when this began. 18 to 19 when it finally went to court. Picture a Norman Rockwell-esque suburban family. Parents, three kids, a yard, and a dog. In a blink and you'll miss it, USA. One random day, a neighbor man has a mild dispute with his neighbor. As a totally warranted response, the neighbor man, takes every hose he has and floods their yard. Solid decisions lead to solid consequences. So naturally, he was fined for the water waste. My dad runs the water in small town USA, and because neighbor man lived a block from us, he decided to drive over to the water district, shouting that he is an acquaintance of my dad. Second solid decision of many to come from neighbor man, Absolutely no one takes kindly to name dropper folks, so tuck that gem away under life facts. My dad comes in and tells him even if his kids did this, they would have the same repercussions. Gracefully glossing over the fact that other than maybe driving by one another, none of us have actually ever interacted with neighbor man. The neighbor man repeats the name of the man working the front desk as well as my parents and claims it's now personal, and storms out. My family members and I began to see neighbor man at random places, constantly. The DMV, the grocery store, our respective jobs. Apparently when you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, and your parents pay for your house, you have all kinds of time to stalk. It went from random sightings while out and about, to phone calls. The cliche type of 90s call, heavy breathing, hang-ups, and I can see you variety. At this point, neighbor man was more of an annoyance than scary. But as I have stated, when you underestimate crazy, you lose every time. The neighbor man began parking across from our house, staying from 6pm to 4am, literally just sitting in his car, blasting music, staring at the house. The fool must have had the determination and bladder of a racehorse, because who sits there for 10 hours? I doubt anyone with a semi-rational concept of social interaction could fathom why. This went on from 3 to 4 times a week to a nightly occurrence. Imagine being a 16 year old female that doesn't even feel comfortable to change in a room because of the prospect that he might see through the blind somehow. Trying to sleep knowing he's out there. We were prisoners in our own home. He began to get bolder, drove his car speeding up and down on the sidewalk, at my sibling and her partner, while they were on the sidewalk, out front, coming home from a date. They both had to physically jump out of the way to avoid being hit. He made lewd gestures at me when I brought my dog out for a walk, and was waiting for my sibling to come out and join us on the walk. It was so bad, I ended up crying and going home. This had to have been going on for a year at this point. The cops always said the same thing. There's nothing we can do unless there is a threat made against you or someone is harmed. My dad confronted the neighbor man in the street after my incident, to which the neighbor man called the cops, and they came over to us, asking us why we were harassing and threatening the neighbor man. I will never understand why the system waits until you're a victim rather than prevent someone from being victimized. Almost two years in, and it's Christmas time, my dad has a brain aneurysm. Fortunately, they made it through without any lingering effects, which is extremely rare. I convinced my other parent, who had been living at the hospital with his sick partner, to come home and shower and eat. At about 9pm, we get a knock at the door, a random man, 
in ratty clothes, holding a Christmas present, says he is there to deliver it to us. We ask him who sent him, and he says he can't say. We ask who he works for, and he forcibly hands the gift over and leaves. We are obviously uncomfortable to open it. Eventually it's decided that they need to know what's in it, so we open the present. Inside is a 17-page document of the grounds of why my neighbor man is suing my dad that was currently in hospital. Even I could tell it was fake with the grammatical errors and typos. The neighbor man took the time to sit and type this up himself thinking it would scare us. The document and fake details he put in did not. The fact this 40-something-year-old man was so fixated on our family that he sat and typed a 17-page fake document did scare us. Things progress, a neighbor man began pacing in front of his car and pretending to have phone calls, where he talked about pushing my dad down the stairs, or knowing where we kids went to school and work and how easy it would be to access us at any time. At the time, I worked a closing shift that let me off at about 1am. He would be parked next to my car and follow me home. One time, I even tried to take random roads, and he still stayed right behind me, pulling up to the house with neighbor man parked across the street, and having to get out to run to the door was a nightmare. We were all exhausted from not only the aneurysm scare, but also living, looking over our shoulders. My dad's friend told her friend, who is a DA, about the situation. She called and came over and took our case on pro bono. Testifying was a wild ride. We had to put in official statements prior to being called to the stand. We were not allowed to be in the room when a family member was testifying nor were we allowed to talk in the halls as we waited for our turn. Imagine reliving two plus years of traumatic experiences being cross-examined when you are made out to be a liar and then not being able to have your family comfort or support you afterwards was not ideal. There was enough to put him away for a year and a half as well as grant a felony restraining order. We moved while he was still incarcerated my sister passed while he was in prison, and he immediately tried to sue her estate. When he was released, he claimed that her testimony from him running his car at her and her partner was false, and the only reason he was locked up, and that the money people donated to a GoFundMe for her accident, he was entitled to. There's so many more details, but this was already long enough. So, neighbor man, you made us prisoners in our home for years. You clearly still are the same and have not learned a thing from your time in lockup. A year ago, my apartment complex decided they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver and rent is pretty ridiculous here so I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I love. I posted on the Nextdoor app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in the area. I immediately got a message from someone named Joe, who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent soon, and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with the owner. I asked if he could send me some pictures of the unit, and he asked me if he could text me some pictures that his neighbor took, because the chat function on the app is really slow. I now feel stupid for doing this, but I gave him my phone number. I kid you not, I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone, so I answered it. I was completely bewildered when the person said, Hi, it's Joe. How's your day going? It took me by surprise, and I didn't know what to say. He started to shoot the shit on the phone, talking about how he works nights, and how tired he is, and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day. I finally interrupt and said, So, about the condo. He pretty much disregarded that, 
and said, I don't think my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you, but I don't have to tell her, right? I said I have to go and immediately hung up the phone. As soon as I did, he started texting me. It was really bizarre and alarming to me. I blocked his number and moments later he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. I'm 32 years old, but it was so disturbing to me that I called my parents to tell them about it and how unnerved it made me. And the worst part is that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible on my profile, but I checked, and sure enough, my address and unit number were public. Unable to contact me any other way, he started messaging me again on next door, asking if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't block or report people on the app, so I deleted it. One night, about a month or so later, I had a knock on my door at around 10 on a weeknight. I looked out my people, but I couldn't get a good enough look at the person. He had his head down slightly. Either way, I don't answer the door for anyone I'm not expecting, especially not a random guy at 10 at night. Feeling panicked, I called my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman and we look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was a delivery guy at the wrong door. She opened her door to get a look at the guy and that spooked him because he ran away. I have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me it was. This was a big wake up call. I always felt like I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know my address was even visible on next door. I'll never be casual or lazy about privacy settings like that again. I live on the third floor of a large house that has been renovated into apartment buildings. The area is urban and relatively affluent, with spacious houses that are very close to one another. Our living room window faces the window of our next door neighbor. I always assumed it was the attic, there seems to be some junk stacked about. And prior to this incident, I have never seen movement or light over there. I know it would suit the story to say it was run down or otherwise creepy but the house is actually quite nice, if not somewhat nondescript. I have a newborn daughter, and she's prone to waking up at regular intervals in the night to nurse. Being considerate, I take her out of our bedroom to avoid waking my husband and nurse her on the futon, where I have a lactation station set up. It was the middle of the night, and we were nursing as usual, when to my surprise, a light came on in the neighbor's window. Moments later, a man walked past the window, happened to glance up, and paused. So we're staring at one another in these opposing windows, and I'm feeling a bit sheepish, so I smile awkwardly. The guy just keeps staring at me with a blank expression on his face. And then, suddenly, he takes off his shirt. Wait, is he? No, nothing untoward is happening. His hands are inside. Being very exhausted, I'm not sure how to handle this surreal, but not quite terrifying situation. The guy doesn't look dangerous, or even interesting. A minute or so passes, and I finally just give him a little wave. He abruptly turns and walks out of sight, followed by the light going off. The following night, my daughter wakes up at roughly the same time. We settle into the lactation station. She's nursing, contentedly. I haven't given him much thought, so my heart sinks when I look up and notice our neighbor in the window again, shirtless, staring at me with the same blank expression. Now I'm a bit pissed off, but I don't want to disturb the baby, so I throw him this aggravated shrug. Here's the creepy part, and it's difficult to write without my hair standing on end. This guy slowly leans forward, placing his hands on the glass, and smiles. The most leering, menacing, toothy smile I've ever seen. His eyes were wide 
and strain him, and it seemed his cheeks would crack with exertion. And then, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, he starts laughing at me. I mean really laughing, cackling hysterically, with his hands still against the glass, and that deranged look on his face. I jumped up and ran into the bedroom where I nursed the baby in bed with my husband and tried to figure out what the hell just happened. It sounds simple, but it's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me, especially considering he knows where I live. When I was about 12 or 13, my mom and dad owned a tow trucking company. This particular day, they went to our neighbor's state, so I had a few friends over, and we were there alone. They came over about 12 p.m. We were doing normal preteen stuff, watching movies, eating junk food, etc. It was also winter, so it started to get pretty dark, fast. We were expecting my mom and dad to come home around 6 or 7. A little before my mom and dad were supposed to be home, there was a knock on my front door. The way my house was set up, the front door was right next to my living room couch, where all of us were. Anywho, my mom is known for kind of being stuck in the 80s. She always wore a leather jacket. One of my friends, we'll call her Tina, looks through the window of the door and says, It's your mom. I see her jacket. And I jump up immediately and look through my window. It's pretty dark at this time and I don't see my father's tow truck. I run to the front of the door, screaming to Tina, don't answer the door, it's not my mom. But it was too late. She opens the door and here comes this 6 foot, 250 pound man with a black stocking over his face, running through my door. All of my friends ran out of my living room and into the kitchen, where the back door was located, and they ran away. Me, on the other hand, I obviously learned that day that my fight, flight, or freeze is to freeze. This man grabs a hold of me and picks me up in the air. I was so scared, I actually peed my pants. I don't remember how it happened, but I managed to escape his grips. I ran out of my back door, down the block to a neighbor's house. We called the cops, and within minutes, there were six cop cars, three on each end of the block. Come to find out, it was my grown-ass neighbor. Allegedly, he was playing a trick on us, a bunch of little girls. He was always a creep. To this day, whenever there is a knock on my door, I literally creep around my house so people can't hear or see me, and I hide until they are gone. First of all, I'm a young woman, barely big enough to walk my dog. If this hadn't escalated at all, I have no idea what would have happened. I'm not easily frightened, but this scared the shit out of me. It's just me and my giant dog in a nice private apartment attached to some townhouses, separated from the other buildings by a strip of woods. It's kind of like a tiny house that just shares a wall with the apartment building. As nice as it is, it's in a not so nice part of town, but I have a backyard, my own space, and working electricity for cheap, so I love the place. It's my first time living out on my own, and I'm not gonna lie, I've been a little freaked out about living alone, even with a big dog for security. So I was in bed browsing Reddit and trying to fall asleep when I heard a tapping on the window. My bedroom has two windows facing the backyard on ground level, about three meters from the tree line, with nothing but grass outside. At first, since I'm not used to sleeping on the first floor, I thought it was a tree or something blowing against the outside of the house. When I remembered, 
I'm on the first and only floor, with no trees close enough to reach the house. I started feeling a bit nervous. I was some weird mix of both scared and annoyed that the tapping was keeping me awake. The noise had my dog's attention, but he wasn't barking yet, which meant it probably wasn't a person, so I wasn't as afraid as I could have been. Gradually, annoyance replaced the fear, and I decided I should tell whatever it was to knock it off. It had been nearly 30 minutes of this weird, uneven tapping. It was almost midnight, and I had an early start in the morning. Best case scenario, there was no one outside, and I was talking to myself with no one out there to hear me. Worst case, there was someone outside. My nonchalance would catch them off guard, and they would leave right? Yeah, absolutely. I figured if there was someone there, they'd expected fear, not conversation. I worked up some courage and called, fuck off, into the dark. The tapping continued. A couple seconds later, I repeated a little louder, fuck off, I'm trying to sleep. The tapping stopped. After a second, I heard a male voice call back. Sorry. The tapping didn't start again. But holy shit, I didn't expect someone to actually be there. I got out of bed and ran to the window with my phone in hand, ready to call the police. But when I peeked through the blinds, I saw the guy with his hands up and the weirdest smile on his face. I quickly turned my phone flashlight on and put it in front of my face so we couldn't see what I looked like. A few seconds later, I turned the light off, and he hadn't moved an inch. Not even his face. He still had that weird, creepy smile, and stared at the window with his hands up, like he was posing for a photo. In hindsight, I don't know why I didn't take one. Finally, he turned around, and started walking back through the woods, and into his own apartment right across from mine. What a way to meet the neighbors. I have no idea what possessed him to tap on my window for half an hour, or what he had in mind, but he hasn't come back yet. I'm not sure what I'll do if he does. I didn't fall asleep, and I'm still nervous to go to bed. Besides, I have a big scary dog for this reason. I should be fine, but still, what kind of person just knocks on some stranger's window at midnight? When I woke up, I saw the window pane on the outside had a few deep scrapes. I'm not sure if the guy had made them, but I reported it to management. I don't know why this guy wanted into my bedroom if he did. I hope he just wanted to rob me. So, weird neighbor across the woods. Let's never, ever meet again. Especially not through my bedroom window in the middle of the night. Back in 2011, I was within a circle of friends that had made it tradition to go camping at a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area right on the edge of a large lake and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it, so during May long weekend, the water levels there were always low, if not completely empty, making it possible to walk across. People were allowed to camp there as long as they weren't causing trouble or making a mess, and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were spaced out far enough apart that you had your own privacy but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year, our spot was in the middle of a small hill with one campsite below us and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without incident. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. At around midnight, the people at the campsite below us were really out of control. They were yelling and screaming, and their music had gotten even louder. 
So our friend Ben went down to ask them to turn it down. He was promptly punched in the face and he came back to us to inform us that he was 90% sure they were on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't as relaxed and we were all somewhat on edge. I was feeling really tired, so I just decided to go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake, including Ben, and one couple, which were Lily and Derek. They were visiting another campsite we had made friends with that day. I could hear that the campsite below us was still blasting their music and partying pretty hard, but I just tried to ignore it and go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I jolted awake. Parts of this are somewhat of a blur. All I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside my tent. I quickly ran outside to find our campsite in chaos. One of my friends was clutching their chest. People were running around and screaming to call 911. I was quickly informed of what happened. Apparently, not that long after I had gone to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided they weren't finished talking to Ben, and on their way up, they had encountered Lily and Derek walking back. Now Derek and Ben are about the same height, and have the same color hair, so they assumed Derek was Ben, and bottled both him and Lily over the head with a full glass bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife, and the others had butcher knives in their hands. Ben saw the knives, and he'd gotten up to go talk to them, and had barely spoken a word when the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the same time, some people from the campsite above had seen the guys coming and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming down the hill when the guy with the butcher knife ran up to him and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, sheer panic ensued. People called 911, but the ambulance was over half an hour away. This is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely, and he was losing blood way too quickly. His friends ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding, but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's, and we were able to keep him calm until the ambulance arrived. The guys with the knives ran off into the darkness, back down to their campsite, and took off in their Land Rover. My boyfriend at the time and I had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the police that were on their way. Once they arrived, we were informed to stay in the car as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the man. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the lake bed when they got stuck in a muddy section of the lake. They were on a cocktail of several drugs, as suspected. Luckily, both Tim and Ben survived. Although Tim had lost a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds, Derek and Lily had huge goose eggs and possibly one person had a concussion, but I can't recall. It was definitely the scariest thing I have ever experienced, and a few of us had to testify against them in court. I've held this story in for the last six years because it sounds crazy and I was told not to talk about it. I went camping six years ago with a now ex-boyfriend of mine. The campsite we picked was beautiful. We were able to drive in through some rough trails. The spot we picked was next to some hiking trails that weren't very far from some natural hot springs and a huge waterfall. We were in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely no one was around. We set up camp next to our car, went hiking, soaked in the hot springs, came back, and had dinner. It was all very normal until we woke up the next day. I need to give some context as to how we slept that night so you can understand my confusion. Before we went to sleep, I put our food cooler and a stereo that we brought in the car and locked it. 
I put the keys in the front pocket of my backpack and put the backpack next to my sleeping bag. On the far side of the tent, away from the door, my boyfriend at the time slept nearest the door of the tent with the gun next to him. We woke up the next morning and I felt fine. I had slept pretty well and from the inside of the tent, everything seemed normal. When we go out, our campsite was absolute chaos. The fire pit we had made was ruined. The cooler had been thrown and food was scattered all over the place. The stereo was smashed to pieces, laying next to a tree. All of the car doors were open, including the trunk. We stood there for a minute, in silence, just taking everything in. The woods felt off now, it was quiet, and not the beautiful campsite that I saw yesterday. Everything about those woods felt wrong now. My ex accused me of not locking the car the night before and that an animal got into our stuff. I promised that I had locked it and went into the tent to grab the keys from my backpack, but they weren't there. I found them later on the ground, right next to the car. We quickly threw everything in the trunk and left. My boyfriend was quiet and wouldn't talk to me about what had just happened. He finally spoke up when we were almost home and told me that he had had a dream the night before about something kneeling over the tent, holding his gun, and just staring at him. When I tried to ask him more questions, he got quiet again, and said he didn't want to talk about it anymore, and that I shouldn't talk about it anymore either. I tried to forget about it, but I just can't. Something really wrong happened to us in the woods that night. Okay, so here goes. My husband and I went camping for the first time ever in Arizona as part of our long trip out west. I would picked out this really cool place that was on a mountain overlooking a beautiful landscape. It's next to a cliff in a really isolated location. I'm talking like 20 miles out on gravel roads in the middle of a national forest. So we get there and set up our tents. We hike a little bit and take pictures of the surrounding area. We see a few cars parked around two tents and decide to stop and talk to the other campers nearby because we had heard that there was going to be a bad storm that night. These were four guys who were from Arizona and they told us not to worry and that the storm didn't get that bad around this area. That was all the persuading that we needed to stay. Later on, while walking a bit further down the campsite, we see a woman there with her dog and an older lady. We smile and wave and continue to hike down a bit, further into the forest. Let me elaborate that, because of the storm, we are one among maybe a total of seven campers that decided to stay and withstand the night. We watch the sunset when we get back to our site, make sure our car was only a few yards away, and go into our tent when it gets too dark to see. There are no stars tonight, due to the storm clouds, and it hasn't begun to rain yet. So we decide to try to sleep right away, so that we could possibly sleep through the storm when it does hit. It is an insanely windy night, so it is hard to sleep. But eventually, we get a bit of shut-eye. I wake up at 10.30pm to the sound of some crazy thunder rolling through the mountains and rain hitting down on our tent. I'm a little freaked out because I get a lot of flash floods out here and I didn't want to fall off the side of the cliff. But I tell myself to try to sleep and eventually, I doze off again. It is 12am and I am awake again, this time because I hear something heavy hitting the side of our tent. It full on sounded like someone could have been punching our tent and sliding something down the side of it. I open my eyes and I can't see anything. It's completely dark, no light whatsoever. The sound continues every couple of minutes and at this point I'm shitting bricks. Suddenly. I hear footsteps right next to my side of the tent. 
They are slow, but steady. I feel my entire body freeze up. I seriously start to think about how this is it, and I'm going to die. My heart is beating so fast that I am certain whatever is out there can hear it. Then, whatever it is, lets out a deep sigh right on the opposite side of the tent. I'm thinking it is a bear, and I'm also realizing that I might actually have to face this thing. In a desperate call for my husband's mind-reading powers, I squeeze his hand really hard, repetitively, and he wakes up. But instead of reading my mind, he blurts out, What's wrong? Why are you squeezing my hand? Right as he says this, the footsteps stop. I don't hear the footsteps again. So, after a while, I break out of my frozen state and tell him what I heard. We decided that it may have been an animal passing by, but whatever was hitting our tent continues every so often, and I'm starting to go a little insane from this night, wondering what is going on. We convince ourselves that it's just pines falling from the trees above us and try to go to sleep again. We just need to make it through one night, then we can laugh about all of this in the morning. A couple minutes go by, and suddenly, the tent caves in on my husband's side, right on his head. He whispers that it feels like something is pushing the tent down. I feel my heart instantly sink. I'm freaking out, thinking it's a bear that just sat on his head. But he decides to push back, and we hear the familiar noise of something sliding off our tent that we've been hearing the past few hours. We then realize it's been snowing outside, and that the noise we heard hitting our tent was heavy ice falling from the trees onto our tent. Our tent is covered in thick ice, and my husband pushes the tent from the inside until all the ice slides off. Still determined to make it through the night, and a little relieved that it was just ice and not a bear, we try to sleep and make it to sunrise. We keep on a small light that my husband, luckily, brought with him just to calm us down a little. Things start to seem normal again. We both close our eyes. It's 3am at this point, not even 30 minutes after we are settling down. My literal worst nightmare happens. Out of the pitch black night, we hear a woman screaming. We distinctly hear her say, What the fuck? Oh my god. What the fuck? Followed by some other non-intelligible words that sound something like, Help. The way that she screams doesn't sound like anger. It sounds like pure terror and a sense of panic. My husband and I are both frozen, looking at each other. I quickly shut off our light and start panicking and asking what we should do. Because what the hell? How is this really happening right now? While we are trying to decide what to do for the next few minutes, we hear her again. But this time, she is screaming, No, 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 as we hear a car speed off into the night. I am in tears at this point. We have no idea what is happening. It's dead silent now, save for the icy rain hitting our tent. It definitely sounded like she wasn't in the car, but more like she was desperately yelling after it, or begging not to be hurt. And this, this was the breaking point. Because I could take the bad weather, I could take the possibility of a bear outside my tent, I could even take the ice falling on our heads in one of the warmest states in America. But one thing I cannot and will not ever be able to handle is a screaming person in the middle of the pitch black woods at 3 a.m. We definitely decide to get out of there and even contemplate leaving our tent and booking it to our car. But instead, we try to stay level-headed and grab our valuables and put them in the car first. We frantically gather our things and stay close as we shuffle to our car. I close the door and keep the lights off for a while, scared to attract any unwelcome visitors. And while my husband goes back to grab the tent, I start the car and call 911. 
I tell them what we heard and where we are, and they say that they are sending someone to the campsite to make sure everything is okay. Only thing is, we are literally in the middle of nowhere, and it will definitely take them more than an hour to arrive. Not to mention, the storm left those gravel roads in some pretty terrible conditions. So my husband and I decide to start driving, and it's now 3.30am. As we drive out of the campsite, my husband notices one last eerie detail that stuck with me. The four guys that we had talked to earlier had left. All three of their cars were gone, all their tents remained. Whatever scared them off, they sure left in a hurry. It was only after we started driving that the thought occurred to me. Whatever was walking next to my tent may not have been an animal. It very well could have been someone lurking around in the dark who decided to go after the girl we had seen previously on our hike. I'm not quite sure what went down on that lone mountain that night and I hope that everyone got out okay. So, Whatever was at our campsite that night, terrorizing us all, let's not ever meet again. Back in 2016, my friends and I for the longest time had been itching to go camping to our local campsite in the Los Padres National Park in Southern California. When we found the perfect weekend to go that didn't interfere with any of our work schedules, we set the date. Three days before the trip, we found out that we were going to get hit by the El Nino rainstorm. Us, being the type of dudes that we are, didn't care if we got hit by the storm while camping. So we packed up our cars and made the 45 minute drive to the campsite. The campsite was a family friendly one where there were about a hundred camping lots that circled around the clearing in the forest. We found the perfect spot that was underneath huge thick trees that would help block as much rain as possible. And it helped that the only restrooms were only 30 yards away. As soon as we got to our spot, we took advantage of the afternoon sky being clear for the moment and we rushed to set up our spot. We pitched our tents close by where our tent doors were only six feet apart. The reason why we did this is because, in order to combat the rain, I bought a 30 foot by 30 foot thick blue canopy tarp that I threw over to cover us from the rain above and from the rain that would be running through the ground. It was a genius move on my part, but whenever you would walk around our tent, you would be making so much noise from crunching the plastic tarp. Hours passed and we were all around the campfire. It was late into the evening and this was the first time that I'd noticed that there were barely any other campers. They were mainly camping in their RVs, like the fake campers they were. In honest opinion, they were the smart ones. Unlike my friends and I, that were sleeping in two small tents, with our only protection being a blue tarp. I was getting tired from a long day at work, and I decided that I was going to go off to knock out. My friends followed my lead as well. The way that the sleeping arrangements were was that I had my friend Ray sleeping in my tent and AJ and S were sleeping in theirs. Before I called it a night, I whispered to Ray and told him, I'm going to prank S and AJ, but I'm not going to say anything. Ray smiled as I dialed my friends up. I called them unrestricted and S's phone started to ring off. Both of them, being the way they are, got timid very easily and said to one another, Who's calling you this late in the night? I don't know. They called me unrestricted. Are you going to answer? Of course not. Ray and I were holding in our laughter as they ignored our call. I decided to do it one more time. Once their phone started to ring, they started to freak out once again. And they said, Who is it this time? Same person, I think. I'm going to answer. As they did answer, S said in a very shaky tone, Hello? Ray and I had to hold in our laughter as we kept as quiet as possible, not wanting to make any noises that would say it was us. I held the phone close to my mouth as I began to breathe heavily in a murderous way. (sighs) 
I ended the call and just hearing them freak out the way they did was making my night even funner. Me being the idiot that I am, called them one more time and this time has picked up the phone immediately and said in a tough voice, Look, whoever this is better stop. I'm about to call the cops if you keep calling. This is not a threat. Ray and I looked at each other as we, at the same time, began to fake moan so loud and immediately started to bawl out in laughter. AJ and S were so mad at us for pulling this prank that they were cursing us out. Me, finally calming down from laughing so loudly, told the boys, Good night, I'll have pancakes ready in the morning. Since I fell asleep relatively easily, I was out in a matter of minutes, while Ray, AJ, and S were up for a while longer. I was the first of my friends to wake up in the morning, and as promised, I had the pancakes cooking by the time anyone else woke up. The smell of me cooking woke up my friends one by one. They got out of their tents. As we were eating, AJ spoke up and said, Hey, Jay, the prank you pulled last night went a little too far. Yeah, you had us ready to run to our car and take off. Me, feeling a bit guilty, apologized and said, Sorry guys, my bad. Yeah, it's one thing to prank call us like that, but then to walk around our tent and then go inside in the middle of the night is totally out of limits, S said. Me not knowing what they were talking about, said, What do you guys mean? Come on, still with the jokes. You were the one that was walking around our tent, and you walked in. Ray spoke up and said, That wasn't Jay who was walking around. I thought that was you two getting your revenge on us for scaring you. That wasn't us doing that. It was you two. So, to explain... After I fell asleep, about an hour had passed where Ray, S, and AJ were still up and all was quiet in the forest until the sound of footsteps were heard, stepping on a blue tarp that was on the ground. At first, my friends thought it could have just been an animal wandering around, but the heavy footsteps were a dead giveaway that it was a person. As they described, the person was walking all around our tents, making constant figure eights. The person would place their fingers on the tent's fabric walls to run them up and down. The footsteps finally stopped after a couple of minutes, right in between our tent doors. The three of them were already having their hearts pounding out of the chest. It was silent for a long minute until the sound of the zippers being slid open. As Jay says, the tent's door was only opened halfway, but it was too dark to see anything clearly. But in the darkness, both S and AJ saw the silhouette of a man's face pop into the tent and look at both of them. AJ and S faked being asleep the entire time, but they kept their eyes locked onto the man. The man then opened the tent fully and walked inside the tent, just standing at the entrance. The man didn't say a word or do anything, just watched both of them laying in their sleeping bags. After their longest minute ever, the man just took his steps out of the tent and his footsteps were heard walking away, disappearing into the night. The entire time that this was happening, S and AJ thought that it was either me or Ray doing this, and Ray thought it was AJ or S doing this. Back to us arguing back and forth at the breakfast table, we were interrupted by a man walking to our campsite, and he said, Good morning boys, how did the four of you sleep last night? This man spoke in a smoker's voice, as if he had been doing it all of his 45 years of being alive. He wore a dirty, sweat-stained white t-shirt that looked more grey at this point, and his blue jeans looked as if they had never been taken off. He smelt like liquor, not a good sign at 8 in the morning, and his words were just mumbling around. We didn't say a word to this guy, as he then asked us if we had any cigarettes to spare. I said that we don't smoke, and he said, Oh, well, if you boys want to visit me in my RV, just stop by anytime. The man continued to walk away, towards the restrooms, 
and as he was done using it, he walked back to our campsite. He didn't say anything this time, but he looked at us and gave us a nearly toothless smile, and then he walked back to his RV. I took note of his RV, as it was the only one that stuck out as being dirty and more run down than the others. We quickly summed up the man as the person who was walking around our tents last night, and S and AJ now remembered that they smelt liquor from the person who was standing in their tent. We all agreed that we should keep an extra eye out on this guy, and if he did spend another night, we would most likely report him to the park rangers if he tried anything else. When it was around lunchtime now, the man came back, not to use the restroom, but just to talk to us. So, are any of you boys interested in buying an RV? You all can go check it out right now and see if you want to buy it. I don't need it anymore since my wife left me. Just check out the inside of the RV. No, we are good, sir, I said with a visible threatening tone. The man seemed to notice this and he walked away. The man did end up leaving a few hours before sunset, but the entire time he was there, he kept glancing at us. The man had his RV about 50 yards away from us, and I noticed that he had a restroom right next to his RV. Why did he make an effort in walking all the way over to our campsite to use our restroom? Also, why did he even use ours if RVs come with restrooms installed in them? Whatever the man wanted, we were just glad that we were about to enjoy the rest of our weekend. Do you remember the early days of the web? AOL software upgrades arrived in the mail on a CD-ROM. Family members shouted across the house at one another. If an incoming call on the landline interrupted the painstaking 10 minutes it took to get from the America Online sign-in screen to hearing you've got mail reverberate throughout the room. Recipients of multicolored chain emails, a serial killer camping out in a young girl's shower and killing her guard dog, truly pondered the threat against their luck for the next seven years if they didn't abide by the message's command to forward it onto seven friends. Better not risk it, we told ourselves, as we quickly typed out seven email addresses in the recipient field. And, finding everything there was to know about a person online, something anyone can do today with a few keystrokes and a credit card. It was a lot harder back then, but not for Corey. I was 15 years old. At the time, ambiguous and exotic usernames like Pina Colada 33 or Brunette Baby 87 were all the rage. Naive as we early screen name pioneers were, this anonymity was smart. Social media was in its infancy. Zanga was the go-to haven for teens and tweens to vent their angst while informing the world they were currently listening to Screaming Infidelities by Dashboard Confessional. Everyone was friends with Tom on MySpace. AIM didn't exist as a standalone messenger service just yet, so it was Emerson Messenger or Bust. But if you had a true AOL account like I did, you were set up with all you needed to discover this new hyper-connected, free-for-all world of the early 2000s World Wide Web, your own email inbox, a new page to create a personal profile, access to chat rooms on just about any topic or hobby you could possibly imagine. It was exhilarating until it was terrifying. One afternoon, I jumped into one of these chat rooms. ASL, 16, female, Boston. I watched the usual exchange between total strangers scroll across my screen for several minutes, hoping to find my opportunity to chime in and introduce myself. Ultimately, I got bored and left the chat without typing a word. Bleep, an instant message appeared on my screen. You didn't say anything, the message read. Why not? Who is this? I responded confused by the username I didn't recognize. I'm Corey, he responded. I'm 16, 8th grade in Lake Charles, Louisiana. What about you? 16 and in 8th grade, yikes. 
and yet, I was intrigued. So, you get held back twice or what? I teased. And so the conversation began. We struck up a brief online friendship that afternoon. He shared a photo. Freckled face, brown hair, nothing I'd rate above a five on hot or not. Yet, despite the friendliness, I refused to tell him where I was from, or anything personal about me, beyond my first name and age. I knew little about the dangers of the internet, but I wasn't dumb either. My username was a fruity drink and some numbers, right? Safe enough, I figured. For background, I did have one of those AOL user profiles. Its standard features included a profile picture and a questionnaire to fill out fun facts about yourself. My photo was one of me with several friends, with no indication of which one was me whatsoever. A few days later, Corey messaged me out of the blue. You're beautiful. What? Brunettes with green eyes, man. He responded. Somehow, despite my photo containing three other friends, he'd accurately identified me. I would love to see you sometime. I felt my skin prick. I politely told him something to the effect of that not being possible and quickly logged off. Friday, the following week, I was sleeping over at my best friend's house. I was logged into my account in the background as we thirstily browsed cute guys on Hot or Not. Bleep. Who's messaging you? My friend asked. I knew. It was Corey. Hey, you live in Houston. Your parents are Jamie and Sarah Miller, and you live at 655 South Grand. You know that feeling when you're on a roller coaster during a sharp drop and your heart jumps into your throat? That was that moment. Fortunately, we managed to find that AOL did, in fact, have a block user feature that night. That was it. So long, creepy 16-year-old middle schooler with scarily good online sleuthing skills. It didn't last long. The next day, a screen name similar to Corey's messaged me. He had another account. I quickly blocked it. This happened five more times. I finally went dark for a while. Sure, I missed the thrill of seeing the yellow envelope appear in my virtual mailbox, but it was better than the threat of being harassed by Corey. A few weeks later, I got home from school. My little sister was a baby at the time, so she had a nanny who stayed with her during the day while my parents were at work. When I walked through the door of the kitchen, she handed me the phone. It's for you, she said, with a quizzical look on her face. Who is it? I really don't know. Some boy with a twang in his voice. Sounds like he's from East Texas or Louisiana. Oh, God. Hello? I finally muttered into the phone. Hey, pretty thing. It's Corey. Hey, so my friends and I are all into the show Jackass. We're thinking of making a trip over to Houston and doing some pranks around town next week. How hilarious would it be if we surprised you at your front door? I choked out a nervous laugh. I mumbled an excuse about having a quiz the next day and quickly hung up. For the next few weeks, I slept with a knife under my mattress. I was absolutely terrified that I'd wake up to this Lake Charles stranger boy on the balcony outside my window. How did he get my phone number? But just as soon as he invaded my sense of security, he seemingly disappeared. No instant messages, no uninvited calls to my home. The knife finally went back into its respective kitchen drawer. Two months passed, and it felt gloriously safe. Until the phone rang, the first week of summer break. Hi. Who is this? I politely demanded. It's me, Corey. Let me be clear. This wasn't the same voice I'd heard two months ago. That voice was dripping in southern syrup. It was young and full of mischief. This new voice was different. It was cold. It lacked any discernible accent 
It was older, and I was speaking to a grown man. I'm sorry I haven't been able to talk to you, he hurriedly blurted. Why did he sound rushed? And I feel terrible, but the police came to my house. They took my computers away from me. I can't say why, but don't worry. I'll come to Houston soon. Click. That was the last day I used that fruity username. I deleted that account and created a new one. I embarrassingly told my parents I would made a huge mistake, despite having shared nothing that could have easily revealed my personal identity. Even if I had, the threat back then wasn't what it is now. This was nearly 20 years ago. People simply didn't have the online presence that they do today. As a teenager, with no social media yet, I was virtually a ghost. But still, I was convinced I was somehow culpable for this stranger. This man, a predator who clearly had advanced knowledge of computers and the internet, singling me out and making it his mission to learn everything about me through whatever means possible. He was determined to get to me. I'm only grateful that even at 15, I knew better than to trust that this freckle-faced kid from an online chat room had fully benign intentions. Two decades later, I still wonder where Corey ended up, hopefully behind bars. Two thousand and two, I was fourteen years old, starting freshman year. I was an awkward, nerdy girl that didn't know how to handle attention from boys. So you could say I made things worse for my situation. I had a knack for making friends with the weird people no one liked, but I tried to be friendly with everyone I met, so it wasn't a big deal to me. Unfortunately, that was also my downfall. Clubs were a big deal, and they actually had an anime club, so of course I was all for that. First club meeting, I sat next to a couple of friends and soaked it all up. I thought I was finally with my people. Then, here comes Stalker Kid. I'd use his real name, but to this day, I have no clue what it is. He sat in front of me, and being that person, I said hi. I could tell he was uncomfortable and didn't know anyone, so I was just being nice. And boy, did this guy cling to me for that one word. At first, he would just find me during lunch and just stand there, mumbling things to me. He had such a soft voice, high-pitched, mousy little guy that you just felt unnerved when he spoke to you. The way he would look at you as he spoke, I could never look him in the eyes. After a while, it became more asking about my personal life and what I was into. Me being dumb and naive, I tried to be friendly and chat while feeling incredibly uncomfortable. After a while, my friends and I would move to different tables, benches, even hallways to avoid him. But he always found me. About a year of this, my best friend finally told me that if I didn't tell him to piss off, he would. I really didn't want him around anymore, so, sure, go ahead. So one day during lunch, here comes Stalker Kid, with his signature greeting, barely above a whisper. Hey, Kath. My buddy just goes, dude, she's not interested, piss off. Looking hurt, he shuffles away. I was like, man, you didn't have to be so hard on him, but thanks. I didn't see him much around school after that, except for club days, where he would just sit across the room and stare at me while my best friend glared at him. Cut to me being 16 and driving now, minus the awkward club days, I didn't really notice anything from him. That is, until an old, grey beat up car started parking next to me, extremely close. One day after school. He was waiting for me in that car. He started asking me how I've been, what about prom, all that stuff. I was just trying to rack my brain on how he knew that was my car, unless he had been watching me before and after school. 
I started getting there late and leaving later to avoid him because he was like clockwork. Finally, a boy I used to be friends with in elementary school was walking out with me and made a comment about how the guy's always next to my car and asked if he was my boyfriend. I immediately said no and he's always following me around and I hated it. It was really starting to freak me out. Bless this guy because he walked right up to him and scared him off, threatening if he ever parked near me again, he would kick his ass. I figured maybe that was enough to keep him away, so again, there was a small space where I would hear nothing of him, except from my friend who had classes with him, telling me how creepy he was. One friend had art class with him, and he said he would draw naked women constantly in his books. All big busted, sexy pose women, classy guy. Junior year is wrapping up, and I started taking my best friend forever to and from school. We'll call him Phil. He was on my way, so I figured why not. At some point, Phil started noticing that the little gray car was always heading the same way after school, and made a joke, thinking what if stalker kid lived next to him. Small world, right? I could only be so lucky. One day, as per usual, the little gray car was following us, so we took a detour. Sure enough, he was with us every step of the way, and it was no longer a joke. We both started freaking out. I pushed the gas pedal as hard as my foot could push and got the hell out of sight. I went home and told my mom everything, because at this point, I knew this wasn't normal. She shoved it aside, saying I was probably seeing things, blah blah blah. It came time for our end of year club party. Of course, Stalker Kid was a senior, so I would never have to see him again. For whatever stupid reason, I offered to host the party, thinking he hasn't gone to one yet. Let's celebrate this moment. I was terrified when my dad let him in the door. I don't remember giving him an invitation to the party, so someone must have given it to him. He spent the whole party talking to me, my dad, being all buddy-buddy with him, asking him where my room was, and I just wanted to cry and hide. It was downhill after that. I remember there were days where I would hear a car pull up outside my front door, and my room having a window that saw the front. I would call my buddy Phil and peek to see if it was him three times in one month. I just hid under my desk and cried on the phone with Phil. Other events from the school would be him asking a girl I played softball with to the prom, only to dump her and follow me all night. This includes after the prom, where I never saw him in person. Our high school had a radio and TV channel for kids to run, and during prom, they would record us going up the stairs and playing around at the gym and after prom so the parents could see their kids having fun. It took one of my friends to point it out, but it showed me playing DDR for a while against my friend Phil. Then stalker kid was standing right behind me watching for a good five minutes. I never knew. And the one that still creeps me out to this day is graduation for his class. Our classes were so big, they did a day and night ceremony, where all the students had to attend the day one. I was scanning the crowd to see my friends who were graduating when I saw a hand wave as I passed by. I looked back, and of course, it was Stalker Kid waving at me. How he picked me out of a crowd of thousands, I will never know. 2006 senior year was great. No signs of creepy Stalker Kid to the point of where I kind of forgot about him. I graduate, I choose a college in town, get a job at a local retail store, and move on. Life was beginning to be normal. I work the gaming department, so you get the weird randos once in a while. One that I saw a lot was this little guy with glasses. This is important. He never purchased anything, but would just walk around from time to time. Then, Stalker Kid comes strolling in the doors and walks into gaming. 
and just talks. I ask how he knew I worked there. He says his friend saw me and knew we were friends. I tried to radio for help over and over for someone to come get him out. Finally, a big guy from computers walks by and asks for my help in the back. Once he pulls me to safety, I tell him everything. From that point, security is aware and is told to watch for this guy. Of course, he wasn't doing anything physical, so all they could do for me is watch out for him. So every time he came in, they would walkie me. I would dip back into the warehouse. I started seeing his friend, who we will call Ninja Friend. He was there constantly, and all he ever did was walk around on his phone. I began to suspect that he was texting Stalker Kid to tell him I was at work, because sure enough, ten minutes later, he would come in, too. So I tested this theory. I started walking around randomly in the store. At one point, a friend who worked the register asked why I was doing this, so I had her take a little walk with me on a break. I told this ninja friend would follow us everywhere, even just going down random aisles. Sure enough, he proceeded to do just that, and she began freaking out. A few minutes later, I told her that my stalker would walk through those doors. Again, sure enough, he did. So I'm making my way to the warehouse, and out steps Ninja Friend from an aisle, and says, She's right here. I just stared at him, like who the hell do you think you are? Stalker Kid walks up behind me, and asks why I'm always running away from him. And, oh, he lost my number, and asks if I can give it to him again. I say, knowing damn good and well, I never gave it to him. Sure. I go to the warehouse. I write, this is where I work, don't ever come here again, and hand it to him. I glare at his friend, walkie security about him, and sit in the warehouse and break down. Security tells me later that he also cried when they took him out. Later that day, as I'm leaving work, security offers to walk me to my car. This, of course, isn't the rules, but friends caring about friends. So I say sure. Stalker Kid is out by my car, waiting for me. So this is where security says, screw it, and calls the police, which we are conveniently next to their headquarters. He books it when he sees the car. A few years go by, nothing comes up. I buy a fancy new car and don't see him much. I'm thinking that did the trick, and I'm finally free. 2012. My buddies and I are leaving work, ready to hit a night at the bar, as per usual Thursday deal. We are all walking out the door, where we all have to stand and wait to hear the alarm sound to verify it's armed. As we are walking out, I hear that awful sound. Hey, Kath. I cringe, grab my friend's arm and turn. There he is, leaning on his car, waiting. My friend recognizes him and asks what he wants. The guy just said he wants to talk to me. He didn't ever see my car, so he didn't think I worked here anymore. His other friend is sitting in the back seat of his car, staring at me blankly. I start to think the worst. If my friends leave me here, my gut tells me, I'm not coming into work the next day, or ever. I'm terrified that he's had years of time to think about our last encounter when I wrote him that note and made him cry. I grab my friend's arm tighter. My friend goes off, pretends to be my boyfriend, and rips into him. My friend is about two feet taller and much, much bigger. They get into it, and I'm just standing in the parking lot, and I'm a terrible person for this but I'm sure you understand at this point, thinking, kick his ass. He spooks Stalker Kid so bad that I'm pretty sure he pissed himself before getting in his car and booking it. Ever since, if he comes into the store, my friend stares him down from his office, and he leaves. He has never bought anything in all these years. Years later, I've moved on and gotten married, 
and I had moved out of town, but recently we've moved back to start a business, and to this day, I still feel myself looking behind me at stores, just in case I randomly bump into him. He caused me to have anxiety, mental and emotional pain, fear and trust issues for a decade. Even after moving on, I still feel the effects today, and I never even knew his name. So a few years ago, I was coming back to work after taking some time off after an operation. I left a regional role for a contract one. That meant a lot less traveling. It meant leaving a job I loved, but I could remain in the transport management at a senior level. For a while it was great, but this was nothing like my previous role, and I meet an engineer supervisor, James. He was super helpful and 28 years older than me. It started with friendly, wanting to sit together over lunch and taking breaks the same time as me. I like to think I was a good manager, so I would bring cups of coffee in for the guys on a Friday, but I did this randomly at all sites. Sometimes coffee, sometimes pizza. Then, when I was coming through the garage, he'd stop me in front of all the engineers and hug me. They'd make jokes about how sweet it was, as he was an older guy, and they all thought it was sweet. I pulled one of the other managers aside and said, Do you not think it's a bit full on? I was 30 at the time and just felt like he was super friendly. I was just trying to fit in. This guy just says to me, he's an old man, lighten up. He'd started to follow me around the depot. The guy started drawing hearts on his coffee cups and it became a huge joke. I carried my own phone and a company one and he texted quite late, asking if I was having a good night, was I out with my friends, and that. All pretty harmless, but after 12 months of being there, I nipped in on a Saturday and was trying to catch up on work. And then he came in. He said he'd seen my car and wanted to know if I wanted company. He stayed a while and said he'll be coming out for drinks next week. I said, oh, I think it was just a management team going. And then he said, Yeah, but I checked with the director Dick, and he says a few engineers are coming too. That night, he touched me, declared his disabled wife, and him, no longer had sex, and basically thought we should hook up. I was taken aback. I said no, and left and told my husband. I had been telling him all along, it was a bit creepy how fond he was and the guys were taking the mick. I approached my director and explained, and he asked if I was on my period to be this moody about banter. I started working at the other sites more and stopped going out for drinks with colleagues because everyone kept saying how much happier he was and how it was just a crush. I left the meeting and then he said, I'll jump in the car with you as all the others are gone. I tried to disagree but the others said they were heading to another site, so we should all just go together. He sent me pictures and told me he loved me. I didn't see the point in reporting this, as it's a boys club, and my director had made it clear that I needed to suck it up. It was becoming harder and harder. I couldn't block his number, as it was a work phone. I hated going into work, and the rumors were fueled by him. The final straw was when he turned up in a full kilt where myself and my girls were having drinks and he joined us. My husband was going mad and I said I would leave the company. It just wasn't worth it. There were other issues regarding this company and I knew I wasn't going to be staying. I took some time off over Christmas and I could bore you with other ways he made my life hell. I would do inspections and ended up trapped in the pit with him. He agreed to run a charity run I was doing, so we'd be away overnight together. And then I pulled out of it. I got a job offer from a smaller company, with the guy who ran it being a belter. He was a family guy, and all about the engineers. Although this was a huge pay cut, and it would mean I would lose my car, but I was seriously considering it. I returned January, and got pulled in by the director. I sit down and start to explain to him how well we had done. 
how well the staff were that I had finished the contract bid and got it signed. He cut me off and told me there had been a complaint. James's wife had contacted HR and told them I had booked hotels on my company card and had nights away with her husband. All kinds of crazy stuff. She was sobbing down the phone and I was going to be investigated. There was also an allegation of handling stolen goods and had alcohol on site. I could have cried. They carried out their investigation and he decided he would ignore me, be rude and dismissive to me in front of staff and generally go on like a horrid person. I waited for Boopa team to come and breathalyze me and carry out a drugs test. The investigation showed I hadn't had drugs or anything in my system. A supervisor that my husband helped with decorating stuck up for me. Also, most of the management team who worked for me and the engineers did go bad for me, but I still handed my notice in. James didn't speak to me, but then the messages started. His wife had found me on Instagram and Facebook and also Twitter. She was messaging my husband. At first, I tried to ignore it as I had a leave date for three weeks time and I just thought I would be away from this nightmare. Then she stepped it up and contacted my future employer, meaning the director of the previous company had mentioned to someone where I was going next. My new employer was amazing and told me to contact the police. I think I just wanted to stop being embarrassed, so I hadn't even thought about it. They said they really couldn't do a lot, as they hadn't threatened me. I was in tears, telling them I could prove where I was when I was supposedly with her husband. The officer was amazing and said what he could do is go and have a word. It then got super crazy and his daughter sent me and my husband messages. These were threats and the officer went back out. Then it all went quiet. One of the guys from my old job contacted me and said that James was seeing someone else on the side. When he got caught and she saw the messages that he had sent to someone else, he didn't want to admit it was another person. So yeah, he could have blown up my entire life. And I know now, at 33, I wouldn't take this kind of nonsense again. I still work for the family guy, but I am super careful. I don't go out for drinks when the team do, and I don't joke with them. I probably come across like a dull shite, but I don't want to meet someone like him or cause that whole fiasco again. I know there were things I could have done differently, and there were so many signs that I missed out on that he was nuts. I am just grateful I left with my reputation intact. James was technically working for the client, which is probably why the director wanted it to go away.